This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 265 of the program. Today is Friday, November 6th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes a Brianna Holiday, Elias Odelstead, Juan Sandoval, Michael Fajti, Nebula, Nick Morgan, Amawale Jabali, Tim Dunn, and Tino. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. I think you all know what we are going to be talking about on today's episode. Of course, we will be talking about the 2020 election, not just the presidential race, but the House and Senate races. I will give you my coverage leading up to the election, my post-election analysis. We'll talk about the aftermath of the election results. We'll go over some ballot initiatives that won and lost. We'll talk about progressives and their races and how they fared. We've got everything covered. So yeah, that's what we've got on the agenda for today's episode. Uh, let's get right to it. We are now seeing the culmination of a months-long ploy by Donald Trump to delegitimize this election because he knows the odds of him just winning legitimately are diminishing. He could still win fair and square. That's a possibility. However, he knows that there has to be some plan in place to get him to cling to power if Joe Biden pulls ahead. And he is using his bully pulpit, the institutional advantage that he has as an incumbent president, to make sure that he wins by all means necessary, even if that means cheating. So he's been griping about mail-in ballots, lying about how they lead to fraud. Now, this is a lie, but he's been conditioning his supporters. So now most people who support Donald Trump probably buy into his lies about how dangerous it is to vote by mail, and they will most likely show up to vote in person. However, Democratic Party voters will be more likely to vote by mail probably being more concerned about the pandemic than Donald Trump supporters. And so what we're going to see is a lot of people vote by mail who are Democratic and a lot of people who are Republican show up in person to vote for Donald Trump. So he tweeted this out. The election should end on November 3rd, not weeks later. Think about what he's saying here. He is literally calling for us to invalidate millions of ballots because it has never been the case that any state has certified the results of an election on election day. That's never happened. We've seen projections of who will win in the media because they basically take their data analysts and they crunch the numbers and make an educated prediction based on who is ahead in certain states. But it's never been the case that states have finished the count and certified the results on the same day. But what he's saying is, listen, all of the votes that come in on November 3rd, that's it. Whatever doesn't get counted isn't getting counted. And he has lawyers ready to uh, basically try to stop the votes from being counted the minute the clock strikes 12.01. Now, David Pakman made a, a really good point that, you know, while the polls are closing in Hawaii, for example, well, it's already November 4th in New York on the East Coast. So, I mean, Donald Trump, it doesn't even make sense what he's saying, but this is all his ploy to cling to power. Because what is probably going to end up happening is a lot of Republican Party voters will show up in person, those votes will get counted first, and it will look like Donald Trump has a pretty sizable lead. However, as states shift to counting the mail-in and absentee ballots, well, we may see the results change. And so what Trump is trying to get his supporters to believe is that that's actually rat fuckery that's happening. It's not just that we're counting the mail-in ballots, which we're expecting to lean heavily in favor of the Democratic Party. That's just Democrats stealing the election. That is called the red mirage. It is not something that is illegitimate. It's not electoral theft or fraud. It's just that we are at a certain point, the states are at a certain point, point in the process of counting the ballots. There's nothing nefarious about that. But Donald Trump wants people to believe it's nefarious because he wants to try to, try to use that as ammunition to steal this election. Because what is he going to do? 
Well, uh, if it does look as if he's in the lead, he is going to prematurely declare victory even if he has not won. So Jonathan Swan of Axios details Trump's plan to declare a premature victory. In this article, that isn't surprising, but I mean, nonetheless, it still is pretty terrifying. He explains President Trump has told confidants he'll declare victory on Tuesday night if it looks like he's ahead, according to three sources familiar with his private comments. That's even if the Electoral College outcome still hinges on large numbers of uncounted votes in key states like Pennsylvania. Speaking to reporters on Senate Sunday evening, Trump denied that he would declare victory prematurely before adding, I think it's a terrible thing when states are allowed to tabulate ballots for a long period of time after the election is over. Trump has privately talked through this scenario in some detail in the last few weeks, describing plans to walk up to a podium on election night and declare he has won. For this to happen, his allies expect he would need to either win or have commanding leads in Ohio, Florida, North Carolina, Texas, Iowa, Arizona, and Georgia. Trump's team is preparing to falsely claim that mail-in ballots counted after November 3rd, a legitimate count expected to favor Democrats, are evidence of election fraud. Many prognosticators say that on election night, Trump will likely appear ahead in Pennsylvania, though the state's final outcome could change substantially as mail-in ballots are counted over the following days. Trump's team is preparing to claim baselessly that if that process changes the outcome in Pennsylvania from the picture on election night, then Democrats would have stolen the election. Trump's advisors have been laying the groundwork for this strategy for weeks, but this this is the first account of Trump explicitly discussing his election night intentions. Now, we're about to find out what happens if he's able to do this. He can't pull this off if it's a blowout and Joe Biden wins pretty quickly and decisively. So this really will hinge on a few key battleground states. Now, the reason why people are worried about this is because if Trump uses his bully pulpit and starts partying at the White House as if he won, well, that can create this sort of bandwagon effect where corporate media will feel pressured to... I'll respond to OAN and Fox News, likely announcing that Donald Trump has, in fact, won. Now, it is the case that since 2000, which is when basically Fox News announced that George W. Bush had won and other corporate media outlets followed suit, they did make some changes. So that way, there isn't a likely scenario where one media outlet will announce and then we'll see this domino effect. Basically, the New York Times lays all of this out in an article. The data analysts of all networks, including Fox News, they're actually separated from the news anchors who are reporting on the results as they come. So that way, these data analysts won't feel pressured to make the call too early and producers won't be in their ear about, you know, pressure them to say who won or will win. So that is something that is encouraging. The problem, however, is that even if Donald Trump says that he won and outlets say Trump falsely claims that he won, his supporters aren't going to listen to the news outlets. So just the mere fact that he is speaking this into existence, they're going to take his word as if it's gospel. And they'll think, okay, well, he, he won. He said he won. So I trust him over the fake news media. So he won. And so he's setting up the situation where his supporters are going to sow chaos as they believe the media or Democrats are trying to steal this election away from Donald Trump, when in actuality, that's not happening. Now, what could they do? Who knows? I mean, they could try to stop more votes from being counted. They could disrupt the counts, intimidate voters at the polls, depending on how early he tries to declare victory. And we don't necessarily know how this is going to play out, although, again, we'll find out soon. But Trump is hinting that violence might actually occur. So as Lachlan Markey of Daily Beast explains, a Supreme Court decision extending time frames for states to count mail-in votes may result in physical violence, President Donald Trump predicted on Monday. They made a very dangerous situation, and I mean physically dangerous, Trump said at a rally in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He was referring to Supreme Court decisions allowing officials in Pennsylvania and North Carolina to continue accepting and counting mail-in ballots in the days after Election Day. They did a very bad thing for the state. They did a bad thing for this nation, Trump said of the decision. The danger that could be caused by that extension, and especially when you know what goes on in Philadelphia, he added. Trump and his allies have described mail-in votes, tallied after election day as tantamount to election fraud, and insisted that a winner of the presidential contest should be declared on Tuesday. So understand what he's saying here. He's not technically advocating for violence, so, you know, he's speaking in a way that gives him plausible deniability. But what he's saying is, because... These states are going to be able to count all of the ballots, and since that might take a while, that's going to lead to violence. Well, where's the violence going to come from? 
He knows where it's going to come from. His supporters, who over the weekend have been shutting down highways and bridges to intimidate voters and literally ran the Biden campaign out of Texas. I mean, he knows that they're not going to believe the media. They're going to believe Donald Trump. So as we try to warn voters that we might not get the results on election day, we warn them about the possibility of a red mirage situation where it seems as if Donald Trump is ahead from the in-person votes and then the mail-in votes tip it in Biden's favor. He is trying to undermine our attempt to inform voters. And he's trying to use the red mirage at worst to seal the election, but at best to sow chaos and division throughout the country using his very loyal cultist supporters who will do whatever he wants at the behest of uh, his presidency. And it's not like they're only implying that, you know, counting all of the votes is tantamount to Democrats stealing the election. His advisors are saying explicitly, if we count the votes past November 3rd, past today, then that is election theft. That is them stealing this election. It's a different world now, George, and that's why we're trying to turn out our supporters. We feel good about it. And one final thing, George, if you speak with many smart Democrats, they believe that President Trump will be ahead on election night, probably getting 280 electorals somewhere in that range. And then they're going to try to steal it back after the election. We believe that we will be over 290 electoral votes on election night. So no matter what they try to do, what kind of hijinks or lawsuits or whatever kind of nonsense they try to pull off, we're still going to have enough electoral votes to get President Trump. Re-elected. Now, that wasn't some random Trump supporter. That is a senior Trump campaign advisor who literally just said on national television to no pushback, mind you, that if Donald Trump is ahead based on where they're at when they're counting the votes, well, if Joe Biden somehow pulls ahead, that is tantamount to Democrats stealing this election. So he's literally saying that if all the votes are counted and who is in the lead shifts throughout the process as we count all the votes that is election theft that is insanity this is anti-democratic rhetoric they don't want the votes to be counted they want to just look at who voted in person assuming that that will most likely be trump supporters disproportionately and then stop all the votes stop the rest of the votes from being counted pause where we're at when Trump is in the lead, and then that's it. We claim victory. But that's not all, because Trump's deputy campaign manager sent out this email to supporters warning that it's actually the Democrats who are trying to delegitimize this election as they warn about a red mirage situation, saying Democrats are panicking because Joe Biden has not run up a large enough lead in early votes in battleground states, and they know that President Trump's in-person votes on election day will make up the difference and propel him to victory. Biden's political operatives have been destroyed distributing talking points and research to delegitimize election day results by coaching surrogates to refer to the president's election day success as a red mirage. The operatives are advising surrogates and media to create a smokescreen by casting blame all around, imagining postal delays or falsely claiming that mail-in ballots that have simply not been returned should be considered legitimate votes that need to be counted. None of this will be true, but it will be held up as proof that President Trump's victory is a so-called red mirage. No one should fall for it. Now, this is, of course, incorrect. This isn't Joe Biden's surrogates talking about the red mirage. It is data analysts who are warning about the red mirage, anticipating more Republicans to vote in person and more Democrats to vote by mail. It's not a talking point from the Joe Biden campaign. And all that people are saying is that we should count all of the votes. See, the problem is that what they want to do is if somebody mails out their, their ballot and it doesn't get there on election night by November 3rd. Well, even if they sent it in weeks ago and it's postmarked for uh, before November 3rd, they want to say, nope, that is no longer uh, acceptable. That ballot is illegitimate. They want to invalidate that ballot, not count that ballot. And the argument that they're making, well, if we count that ballot, that's Democrats stealing the election. I mean, this is projection because that's exactly what they're trying to do. Now, we don't necessarily know what's going to happen. Like, it could be an anticlimactic evening right? Joe Biden could end up winning quickly. Trump could end up winning quickly. We don't know what's going to happen. But even if Donald Trump isn't able to steal this election by using the red mirage to, you know, create some sort of legal battle or try to stop the counting process, still the amount of chaos that he's trying to sow is truly astounding. 
Over the weekend, we have seen Donald Trump supporters increasingly ramp up their efforts to intimidate voters across the country, with the most high-profile case being this viral video where Trump supporters in multiple vehicles literally ran a Biden campaign bus out of the state of Texas. About to run out of gas, which I'm sure some of you would love. <laughs> oh, shit, look at that. <gasps> oh my god. Now, the Biden campaign, because of this, literally had to cancel an event in Texas. Now, if this was just some like impromptu protest when they saw the Biden campaign bus, I think that that's fine right? Nobody cares if you're going to protest politicians. In fact, we should be protesting politicians. But this was a coordinated effort to intimidate the Biden campaign to get them to leave the state of Texas. That is something very different, something much more nefarious than protesting politicians. This is intimidation. Suppression of the opposition forcibly. And this isn't a new phenomenon, as this Twitter user points out, saying, I'm in East Texas. Since about September, we've been subjected to these tactics. For instance, every weekend, they have a MAGA parade through town. They drive to the areas that are predominantly black with their flags and guns on full display. It's designed to intimidate us. And he's 100% correct. This is specifically designed to intimidate voters, intimidate people who don't fall in line and support Donald Trump. And it's not something that's unique to Texas. As you can see from this tweet here, there were cars in New York driving around with an anti-fascist on their hood to signify them, I guess, running over anti-fascists. So, you know, this is them signaling their support for violence of the opposition. And also in New York, Trump supporters literally blocked and completely shut down Mario Cuomo Bridge. They shut it down completely. These are the same people who tell us that we should run over protesters who block traffic. But now they're literally shutting down a bridge. And in New Jersey, Trump supporters completely shut down Garden State Parkway. So it's okay for them to shut down highways. They're just being patriotic and showing their love and appreciation for the president. But when Black Lives Matter, Matter protesters do that, they celebrate when cars drive through them. This is what we're dealing with now. Now, in this next video that I'm going to show you, we don't have the context as to why this altercation happened, but basically a group of Trump supporters circled a 20-year-old girl, and what happened was horrifying. They're blocking me in. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Hey, report. That's fine. They're blocking me in. The Patriots followed me. This is their true colors. I want everyone to know they came. This is a hate crime. They're coming up to my car right now. Get out of the car. Get out of the car. Get out of the car. I'm not scared. If I was scared, I would have left. I need everyone to see this. That's why I'm chilling right here. For what? You call me what? I, yeah, you call me. I got it. Oh, herself. Oh my god, what the hell? Ew. You came, you came strapped up like that for a 20 year old female? Oh, you a big man. For a female, bro. For a female. It's up to us. Come get it? Are you saying come get it? From a, uh, for a female. Hey! What? Hey, she's a female? <laughs> right here. Let's no, go so you guys can jump me, so you can jump me. Put your phone down. What's up? Put your phone down, baby girl. It's a toast for me. Hey, it's your fucking face for me, bitch. Do something. Do something. Motherfucker. Do something. Do something. Fucking stop your fucking phone right out of your fucking hand, bitch. Back up. They boxed her in, they yelled at her, they called her racial slurs, they uh, were trying to get her 
to come out of the car. They were confronting her. I, I mean, presumably, they're trying to fight her. Now, I don't know, again, what happened, what led to this. Maybe she yelled something at them. Uh, you know, one of them was saying, I want to talk to you about what Black Lives Matter means. So maybe she yelled Black Lives Matter when she saw the trucks. Maybe she flipped them off. I don't know. But whatever she could have done, would that really warrant them trying to box her in to a parking lot so where she, she can't leave? And they confront her and make it seem as if they're going to physically harm her? Is that really warranted? Is there anything that she could have said to warrant this type of behavior? Now, the reason why Trump supporters are doing this is because Donald Trump is encouraging them to do this. Whenever they do something like this, he cheers it on. So in response to the Trump convoy driving a Biden campaign bus out of Texas, he tweeted out that video and he said, I love Texas. And he also then joked about it facetiously at a campaign event. It is something. Do you see the way our people, they, you know, they were protecting his bus yesterday because they're nice. So his bus, they had hundreds of cars, Trump, Trump. Trump and the American flag. That's a, you see Trump and American flag. Do you ever notice when you see the other side? I don't even see much of the other side. They were just protecting his bus. <laughs> I mean, if that were anti-fascist protesters driving out someone, you know, with a Trump flag out of an area, he would call them Antifa terrorists. But because it's his supporters and they're intimidating uh, other voters and they're also trying to forcibly suppress the opposition at the behest of Donald Trump, well, he loves it. And it's not just Donald Trump who's cheering on this type of behavior. It is other Republicans who openly celebrate this as well. Listen, I saw yesterday a video of these people in Texas. Did you see it? All the cars on the road with the... We love what they did, but here's the thing they don't know. We do that in Florida every day. We love it. We love what they did. And they do it in Florida every day. Again... If the left were doing this, we know exactly how Republican Party politicians would react. We see the way that they act uh, whenever they think that protesters aren't being civil enough. But when they have their people literally driving the opposition party out of a state, intimidating the campaign bus of the Biden campaign, shutting down highways, it's fine. There's a double standard here. When they do it, it's not violent. When we do it on the left, when we protest, well, by definition, we're bad because our protest is illegitimate and anything that they do to promote Donald Trump is good. So you have to understand that this isn't just like some unique phenomenon that will only occur because of Donald Trump and the 2020 election. Even if Donald Trump is defeated, fascism isn't just going to disappear. It's going to be here for a while because the Republican Party isn't just a far-right party or a proto-fascist party. They have become officially a fascist party because one of the hallmarks of fascism is forcibly suppressing your opponents. And they are now doing that and sitting members of the Republican Party are cheering them on when they foster this environment where their opposition can't even hold a campaign event without intimidation, without armed militia members showing up to scare them out of the state. I mean, this is fascism. And we've seen this happen a lot more in more rural areas of the country when there would be these more small-scale Black Lives Matter protests during the height of the George Floyd uh, protests. And you would see members of far-right pro-Trump militias show up, stand there with guns to intimidate the peaceful Black Lives Matter protesters. And police officers would let them do it. And, you know, they'd oftentimes coordinate with cops in many instances, including in Oregon, in rural areas of Oregon. It's happening everywhere. This is fascism. And historians are warning that if we don't stop this fascism right now, then there's going to be a point where it's too late. We will reach a tipping point, a point of no return, where we're no longer a democracy. We're just a flat-out authoritarian regime. And as Brett Wilkins of Common Dreams explains, over 80 historians of fascism and authoritarianism from around the world signed an open letter Sunday warning that American democracy is in existential peril and urging people to take action now before it's too late to save it. Regardless of the outcome of the United States election, democracy as we know it is already imperiled, the letter opens. Whether Donald J. Trump is a fascist, a post-fascist, a populist, an autocrat, or just a bumbling opportunist, the danger to 
to democracy did not arrive with his presidency and goes well beyond November 3rd, 2020. It continues, the letter notes that while democracy appeared to be flourishing everywhere in the years following the end of the Cold War, today it seems to be withering or in full-scale collapse globally. As scholars of 20th century authoritarian populism, fascism, and political extremism, we believe that unless we take immediate action, democracy as we know it will continue in its frightening regression, irrespective of who wins the American presidency in early November, the authors write. I've been an election observer in broken authoritarian countries, and let me tell you, Trump's behavior would be swiftly and unequivocally condemned by all international election monitors if it was happening elsewhere, Brian Class, a political scientist at the University College London, tweeted last month. He is behaving like the despots past presidents condemned. Anne Berg, a history professor at the University of Pennsylvania, whose grandparents were Nazis in Germany, warned earlier this month that the U.S. is in a rapid descent towards fascism. People need to be aware of the risks we are facing right now, Berg told the Philadelphia Inquirer. So this goes deeper than Donald Trump. This is deeper than Donald Trump. Look at the GOP's efforts to undermine this election. Look at the way that the Republicans in Texas tried to invalidate more than 100,000 ballots in Harris County. All around the country, we are seeing the GOP suppress the votes, try to make sure that less and less people vote, and forcibly suppressing their opposition is one of the hallmarks of fascism. And we are seeing this in the open now, to where, you know, when one of their support groups intimidates voters, intimidates their opposition, they're celebrating it, they're cheering it on. So what these historians are saying is, this could be the beginning of the end. We could devolve into an authoritarian regime if we don't stop it. So what do we do? They say that there's still time left. There's some hope, right? So what do we do to stop fascism? Well, they say we can stop it by boldly and unapologetically safeguarding critical thinking based on evidence, including by supporting investigative journalism, science and the humanities, and freedom of the press, securing commitments from corporate media, organizations, and governments to tackle the dangers of misinformation and media concentration. Good luck with that. Building coalitions organized across differences of race, class, gender, religion, and caste and respecting the perspectives and experiences of others, revealing and denouncing any and all connections between those in power and those vigilante and militia forces using political violence to destabilize our democracies, being prepared to defend pluralism and democracy against the growing dangers of communal violence and authoritarianism at the ballot box, but if necessary, also through nonviolent protest in the streets, defending the integrity of the electoral process and ensure the widest possible voter turnouts, not just in this election, but in every election, large and small, in all of our hometowns, recommitting to a global conversation on support for democratic institutions, laws, and practices both within and between our respective communities. Now, I don't mean to be too cynical, but when I hear this, I think, yeah, this, uh, this isn't going to stop fascism. We've been protesting. That's not going to stop fascism. We've been calling out the relationship between militias and our elected officials, white supremacist groups like the Proud Boys and their connection to police departments. And nothing's happening because we've devolved so far into fascism they're just suppressing these protest movements i mean we saw how bill barr trump's attorney general literally gassed peaceful protesters just to clear the path so trump can have a photo op so it's almost like we're past the point of no return but what do i know because these are the experts so they clearly know more about it than me but one thing that i do find persuasive is if there is this coalition you know this anti-racist union anti-fascist union across the country that forcefully denounces this if we can somehow defeat donald trump and really delegitimize fascism and fascist politics maybe that can do it i don't know though because it seems as if with how far we've crossed into fascist territory it's really difficult to put the cat back in the bag like once you've opened Pandora's box, how do you close it? That's the question. So when I see all of this with Trump supporters, like, do you think that fascism and the threat of fascism is just going to go away if Donald Trump goes away? The end of the Trump era is not going to mark the end of fascism. It will continue and somebody else will pick up the torch once Donald Trump is gone. So this should worry everyone. We should be educating people who we know in our personal lives if they support Donald Trump. Let them know that the GOP has become increasingly fascistic. And if we don't stop, then we're not going to have a democracy left. Like we talk about how democracy is already like dying and declining in the United States. If you even want to argue that we were a thriving democracy from the get go. But 
whatever hope we had, what progress we've made towards democracy in this country is being undone before our very eyes. And this is something that we have to take seriously. Anyone who has studied political science, comparative politics, the historians, they know that what we're seeing is the breakdown of democracy, the beginning of the breakdown of democracy. But there can only be so much that happens, so much erosion of our democratic institutions before it's too late. And you can't undo the damage that's been caused. So we have to do what we can to stop fascism before it's too late. So even though polls between Donald Trump and Joe Biden are starting to tighten, the GOP knows that they're not really going to easily pull out a victory legitimately. So the way that they are going to tip this election in their favor is if they do what they usually do. Cheat. Voter suppression. Purge voters off of the rolls, invalidate ballots, limit the number of polling stations, because they know that if they could suppress the vote, keep turnout as low as possible, they will most likely win. Now, one story is uh, very, very brazen in how they tried to invalidate more than 125,000 ballots in one county in Texas. But thankfully, we got some good news regarding that effort, and a judge has decided to throw out their case. So as the AP reports, a federal judge on Monday rejected another last-ditch Republican effort to invalidate nearly 127,000 votes in Houston because the ballots were cast at drive through polling centers established during the pandemic. The lawsuit was brought by conservative Texas activists who have railed against expanded voting access in Harris County, where a record 1.4 million early votes have already been cast. The county is the nation's third largest and crucial battleground in Texas, where President Donald Trump and Republicans are bracing for the closest election in decades on Tuesday. U.S. District Judge Andrew Hannon's decision to hear arguments on the brink of Election Day drew concern from voting rights activists and came after the Texas Supreme Court rejected a nearly identical challenge over the weekend. The ruling came in response to a lawsuit by conservative GOP activists who have filed a battery of court challenges over moves to expand voting options during the COVID-19 pandemic. Pandemic. The challenges have not involved Trump's campaign. Another 20,000 or more voters were expected to use drive through polling locations Tuesday, said Harris County Clerk Chris Hollins, the county's top elections official. Several voters who already used the drive through centers rushed to join mounting opposition to the lawsuit, including a Houston attorney whose wife was 35 weeks pregnant when she cast her ballot. She gave birth to twins Friday. My vote counts, David Hobbs said. My wife's vote counts. So at a time when we are living through a pandemic during an election, they're trying to limit the number of ways that we can vote. Why? Because they have to suppress the vote to win. They can't win by persuading voters to support their party because they know that they are a minority party and most of their ideas are very unpopular. So they suppress the vote. They try to uh, limit the number of ways that we can vote during a pandemic when we should have more ways to vote than ever. So this party knows exactly what it's doing. And it's getting so bad that even other Republicans are starting to speak out. So the former Texas House Speaker, Joe Strauss, actually condemned what they're doing publicly, saying the lawsuit attempting to disenfranchise more than 100,000 voters in Harris County is patently wrong. All of us who believe in the core ideals of this country should want more votes counted and more voices heard. While it may be too late for this election, the Republican Party needs to return to a place where we win with ideas and persuasion rather than trying to intimidate and silence our fellow citizens. I hope all elected statewide leaders in the Texas Republican Party will stand up against these desperate tactics. Yeah, I do too, but that's not going to happen. And the reason why it's not going to happen is because even when we get Republicans who speak out against this, it's when they're not in a position of power. Like you were the uh, Speaker of the Texas House uh, up until 2019. Why didn't you speak out then? I get that th this wasn't happening in Texas, but we still saw huge amounts of efforts around the country in 2018 to suppress the vote. Look at Georgia. So why don't Republicans speak out? against their party more frequently is it because there's this like large swath of you know uh principled republicans who just they're just watching all of this and they're disgusted but they don't want to say anything no it's because this guy's an outlier and it's because the republican party they want power so they know that they have to get increasingly fascist in order to win elections that means silence their opposition 
rig elections effectively to make sure that they win by all means necessary, even illegitimately, because they don't care at the end of the day. The goal is to get power. So, you know, the uh, the means are justified by the end goal, what they actually achieve. So if that means actually crushing democracy to win, that's what they're going to do. So, you know, I'm thankful that the judge threw out this case that they filed at the last minute when drive through voting was a thing that has been going on, uh, that they knew would happen. But still, the fact that we have to fight to uh, get them to not invalidate ballots, that shows you that this party is completely irredeemable. A political party in a democracy, a so-called democracy, as much as, you know, a democracy that we are, should never want to invalidate ballots, even if that means they're going to lose. Because if they try to suppress the vote and rig elections, that proves that they're no longer buying into this idea of democracy. They've become authoritarian. They've embraced fascism. So at the end of the day, this should be a no-brainer. But the fact that we have to even celebrate a victory where a judge says, no, you can't just like invalidate 127,000 votes. That shows you how bad of a state we're in. Like, I get it. We're all breathing a sigh of relief, right? Because I was expecting this judge to uh, not throw out this case, but thankfully he did just that. But we shouldn't have to celebrate things like this. Like, of course, it should be just a no brainer that the votes are counted. Like, what are we doing? So, I mean, look, if Democrats somehow are able to win and take back the Senate, in spite of all of the efforts of the GOP and Donald Trump to rig this election in their favor, their number one priority is to make sure they do voting rights, electoral reform, make sure that you combat voter suppression efforts and you strengthen democracy, consolidate democracy, because if you don't, then it may be too late. You may not be able to have an opportunity to take back power again. So, I mean, this is this is troubling. Again, it's a victory. So I don't want to rain on everybody's parade, but it's a victory that we shouldn't have to even fight for. There shouldn't even be a fear that votes that have already been cast will be invalidated, but this isn't the end of it. Donald Trump is going to fight to basically stop the vote from being counted if he sees that he has some advantage electorally from declaring early on election days. So, I mean, we're in a really tumultuous period, uh, tumultuous period, uh, in American history, and um, it's going to get ugly if they actually are successful at carrying out their undemocratic agenda. So at one of his rallies, Donald Trump was complaining about all of the coverage that COVID-19 receives, and that led to his cultists chanting, fire Fauci. Now, the reason why they don't like Dr. Anthony Fauci is because he is seemingly contradicting what Donald Trump says because Donald Trump is anti-science and because Donald Trump doesn't want to listen to the input of health experts. Well, you know, it seems as if Dr. Fauci is anti-Trump when in actuality, Donald Trump is anti-science. But having said that, though, I mean, this is to be expected from Donald Trump supporters. Anyone who contradicts Daddy Trump they're, by definition, the enemy. Uh, but what Donald Trump says is what I really want to zero in on here because he uh, hints at what he will do after this election with regard to Dr. Anthony Fauci. Rounding the turn. I say it's, it drives him crazy. It's rounding the turn because all they want to do, you turn in the news, COVID, 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 COVID. We'd like to talk about COVID and then uh, next turn. Here's what happens. November 4th. You won't hear too much about it. You won't hear too much about it. Don't tell anybody, but let me wait till a little bit after the election. Please. I appreciate the advice. Appreciate now, he's been wrong on a lot. He's a nice man, though. He's been wrong on a lot. All right. So first of all, um, this is a cult. They act as a hive mind with <laughs> Donald Trump basically being like the hive mind leader. But in response to um, them chanting fire Dr. Anthony Fauci, he says, I might do that. But after the election. Now, if Dr. Anthony Fauci is wrong, why would you wait until after the election? Just do it right now. Why wait? Well, because he knows that Dr. Anthony Fauci is one of the most trusted public health officials in the country because he is an apolitical individual. He is not a political actor. 
He is giving raw information about science and what we know about COVID-19. But because Donald Trump is an imbecile who does not want to listen to scientists and epidemiologists and health experts, because he cares more about the economy than actually containing the spread of the virus, then, you know, he uh, is against Anthony Fauci. They've, they've butted heads multiple times. And what Trump doesn't realize is that you can't just choose to, you know, save the economy if we throw everyone else under the bus. If lots of people suffer from this illness and they die, that's also going to hurt the economy. But he doesn't care. He He's a child, basically. Um, and his supporters don't like that Anthony Fauci uh, is saying things that Donald Trump doesn't like, so they want him to be fired. Because how dare you question Donald Trump? If you're working in the White House, you have to be unequivocally, you know, uh, loyal to Donald Trump under every single circumstance. It doesn't even matter if he's incorrect and he's spreading misleading information about a virus that we all are suffering from currently. It doesn't matter. If you contradict Daddy Trump, you are the enemy, and Daddy Trump must fire you. It's a cult. Now, it's funny that Donald Trump said, oh, well, you know, the media, they won't stop talking about COVID-19, but wait until November 4th, once this election is over, then they're going to stop talking about it. And this mentality is so stupid because so many Americans, they, they think that America exists within a vacuum, that we're the center of the universe, and no other country is dealing with the pandemic currently. I mean, Europe is seeing their second wave, record numbers as well. So are all of the other countries in the world just going to stop talking about COVID-19 and pretend as if it's not important after this election? Well, no, of course not. That's preposterous. But Donald Trump, according to him, you know, being the narcissist that he is, he's the center of the universe. So this pandemic is really just a conspiracy to hurt him. Now, mind you, he didn't have to make it be this way. Like, he could have actually been competent and not bungled his response from the beginning. He could have made it so that way this wasn't a political issue for him. But because he's incompetent, because he has decided for whatever reason to undermine our attempts to contain the virus at every step of the way... Well, it is hurting him. I mean, the post office, USPS, we found in, what was it, July, August, that they were going to send out five face masks to every single family. And guess what? He unilaterally stopped that because he didn't want to create a panic. He has made us less effective at dealing with the virus. So because COVID-19 hurts him, that's on him. A competent leader would not be harmed by a pandemic if they actually took it seriously. Now, the reason why this is important is because it gives us a little bit of a sense of what to expect. Him saying that he may fire Dr. Anthony Fauci after this election, uh, it's telling. Because if he is re-elected, then he's going to take the virus even less seriously because he doesn't feel as if he has to even pretend that it's important during an election because he wants to get re-elected. Or, you know, who knows what he could do. The damage that he could cause during, uh, you know, the period between which he loses this election, if he loses, and January 21st, when Joe Biden is sworn in, like that could be a lot of damage. He could fire Dr. Anthony Fauci then, you know, and um, even though Joe Biden could bring Anthony Fauci back, you know, that's that's a long period of time. That's two months if Trump loses, where we're operating in the dark, where we have nobody that's giving us actually factual data from this administration. We've already seen how he's tried to basically silence the CDC. Um, so, you know, and that's if he loses. If he wins, the damage will be even worse. So either way, like, we are disadvantaged, comparatively speaking, to other countries because Donald Trump refuses to take this seriously. Even Boris Johnson you know, after he got COVID-19, he started taking it seriously. You know, at first he was not, but he got the virus and then he took it seriously. Donald Trump still got the virus, isn't taking it seriously. So we're almost uniquely disadvantaged when we're the richest country in the world. We shouldn't be at this disadvantage, right? But because we have an imbecile in the White House who doesn't actually care and who has actively tried to undermine our efforts to contain the spread of the virus... I mean, this is going to stick around longer than uh, than other countries, I, I would imagine, right? Now, over the next four years, Donald Trump uh, knows that he doesn't have to do anything because a vaccine will become more widely available. Whether or not people can afford it is a different question, but he knows he, do, he doesn't, even, if he gets reelected, he doesn't even have to pretend to care about the virus anymore, right? It'll probably be gone 
by 2024. And he even if it wasn't, he doesn't care because he can't seek re-election in spite of him wanting to do that. So, you know, it's going to be around longer in the United States because of Donald Trump. And um, because of that, there's going to be more and more suffering. So my only hope is that if Trump loses and Biden comes to power, that he takes this pandemic seriously. And then since someone with a D in front of their name is in power, hopefully Trump supporters will begin to realize how much damage this has caused. I don't care who they blame. They could blame Joe Biden. But hopefully they actually take the deaths of Americans seriously. I mean, 230,000 Americans dead at the time I record this video. That number is rising rapidly. So the fact that they're not taking this seriously when the response to 9-11, which was 3,000 deaths, was never forget. Now, all of a sudden, we're, we're forgetting as it's happening. And it's just, it's, it's astonishing. It's because Trump is the one who's in charge. And Trump is the one who isn't taking it seriously. So it's cognitive dissonance. And that's to be expected when you are in a cult. So, you know, Trump here saying that he might fire Dr. Fauci, it's, it's not surprising, but it still is uh, really, it would be harmful, I think. I'll tell you, when Donald Trump said that he could literally, you know, stand down Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and get away with it, he was so correct. Like, that's the truest statement that Donald Trump has ever said, because even though he treats his own supporters terribly, they will never abandon him. There's a, a certain share of the population in this country who will never abandon Donald Trump no matter what, even if he personally abuses them. I mean, we saw last week at a rally that was held at an airfield in Omaha, Nebraska, hundreds of his supporters were left stranded in freezing cold weather while they were waiting on buses to pick them up and take them back to their vehicles. Some had to walk three miles because they couldn't take waiting any longer, and others literally had to be taken by ambulance. It was that cold. And guess what? This happened again, but this time in Rome, Georgia, because his supporters were once again left stranded after a rally while they were waiting on buses to transport them back to their cars. So Trump didn't care. He got in, did the rally, and left. But believe it or not, that's like the least bad thing that he's done to his supporters in terms of things that he's done to harm his own supporters, because the worst thing that he has done is expose his supporters to COVID-19. Because he's holding these rallies, uh, I believe on Monday, he did 10 events in a day, holding these rallies where people are in these really large crowds, packed tightly together, nobody's wearing masks, or a few people are wearing masks, they're cheering loudly, spreading germs, and guess what's happening? They are being exposed to COVID-19. And you'd think that after one of his loyalists, Herman Cain, showed up to a rally, contracted COVID-19, presumably at that rally, and died, he would take this more seriously. Acknowledge that he should at least care for the people who support him the most. I mean, he doesn't care about taking this virus seriously because he doesn't care about Americans. But the people who support you, you know, in theory, you'd care more about their health and well-being, but he doesn't care. So the question is, how do we quantify the damage that these rallies are causing? How many people is he exposing to COVID-19 with these rallies? Well, the researchers at Stanford University attempted to find this out, and they have determined that it is a lot of people. Thousands are being exposed to COVID-19, and hundreds have died as a direct result of his rallies. So as Jordan Williams of The Hill reports, a new study from Stanford University found that 18 of President Trump's campaign rallies have led to over 30,000 confirmed coronavirus cases and likely led to over 700 deaths. Researchers examined rallies held between June 20th and September 22nd, only three of which were held indoors. The researchers then compared the spread of the virus in the counties that held the rallies to counties that were on similar case trajectories before the rallies occurred. The authors concluded that the rallies increased subsequent cases of COVID-19 by over 250 infections per 100,000 residents. They found that the events led to over 30,000 new cases in the country and likely resulted in over 700 deaths, but recognized that the deaths were not necessarily among attendees. Quote, our analysis strongly supports the warnings and recommendations of public health officials concerning the risk of COVID-19 transmission at large group gatherings, particularly when the degree of compliance with guidelines concerning the use of masks and social distancing is low, the authors wrote in the paper. The communities in which Trump rallies took place paid a high price in terms of disease and death. The study was published to preprint platform SSRN on Friday. So using data from 
uh, cities where rallies were held to other cities on similar trajectories, they were able to extrapolate and estimate that hundreds of people died because of Trump rallies. And this isn't super surprising. And sure, they're not directly confirming that these cases are linked to Donald Trump. But the data is sound because when you look at these videos and you, you just see them, it's common sense. Like, of course, more and more people are going to contract COVID-19, especially assuming that Trump supporters aren't taking this seriously to begin with. They're not wearing masks. They're not, uh, you know, social dis distancing. They're, they're pretending like it's not a thing. They think that it's exaggerated. They think that the number of deaths is being um, overinflated when in actuality it's probably um, a lot larger. And it's just, you know, you think, again, that he would care the most about the people who are the most loyal to him, but he doesn't. And he genuinely enjoys these rallies, and he thinks that this is going to help him because it shows how enthusiastic his supporters are in comparison with, you know, Joe Biden's supporters who aren't very enthusiastic. Look at his crowd sizes. So he wants to try to gin up some sort of excitement, knowing that he needs anything to help him cross that finish line. And as a result, his own supporters are paying because of it. But I mean, I, it, they're willingly exposing themselves, right? By going to these rallies where nobody's social distancing, when you know you're going to be in a crowd. I mean, what do you expect? I mean, I, uh, this is exactly what you can expect. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. You're showing up to these rallies with a bunch of MAGA chuds who think that the virus is probably a hoax. And you're surprised that you're exposed. I mean, it's sad. Like, I don't want people to have to take the virus seriously only after they've gotten it. Or know a loved one who died because of it. But unfortunately, some people, like, they don't wake up until it's too late. And Trump is endangering his own supporters for political purposes. And, you know, it's disgusting, but it's their own fault too, right? You can't only blame Donald Trump because they are willingly showing up to these events, even though Donald Trump is leaving them stranded and exposing them to COVID-19. And they're exposing each other to COVID-19. I mean, it's like they're suckers for punishment and they like it. So whatever. I mean, anything for daddy Trump. This is what happens when you're in a cult. You do anything for dear leader, even if it means that you're hurting yourself physically, directly. Well, yesterday was the big day and a lot has happened and we are getting more results as I film right now. So I can't necessarily speak with much specificity because Everything that I'm talking about is subject to change. Things are moving rapidly, so I can only speak broadly about this election, but I do want to give you some takeaways. Um, basically, what we expected would happen did end up happening. Early on in the night, you know, based on the polls, we were kind of hoping that this would all end up in one big anti-climatic ending, where Biden wins Florida, and then basically Trump doesn't necessarily have a path, or if he has a path, it's very narrow, so we can kind of breathe easy. But that didn't happen. And what we instead got was the Red Mirage situation, where it seemed as if in states like Michigan and Wisconsin, Trump was leading, going to bed. We kind of thought, all right, you know, since Biden is underperforming the polls in other places, it isn't illogical to think that maybe the red mirage isn't, in fact, a mirage. I mean, I fully expected uh, the mail-in ballots to come in and heavily favor Biden. The question was whether or not there would be enough to make up that difference. And the answer is that, yes, there was enough to make up that difference. And because we got that red mirage scenario, Trump capitalized on that opportunity to prematurely declare victory. But as it stands right now, Biden is in the lead, and they just called Wisconsin. I think they're on the cusp of calling Michigan for him, and Trump is running out of paths to win this. In fact, I would say that Biden is very likely going to reach that 270 number. We might not even need to wait to see the results of Pennsylvania. It might not necessarily be something that we're waiting on, which was what it seemed like last night when, okay, we don't know when we're going to get the counts in Pennsylvania. And I think that Trump's team is really trying to get the result from the Supreme Court flipped, which allowed them to continue to count votes received, I believe, up to three days after the election. Now that Amy Coney Barrett has been confirmed, his team legally is trying to stop that. But even if Trump is successful there, well, if Biden wins Nevada and Michigan, he just won Wisconsin, that's 270. That's it. So your path diminishes. And he's running out of ways to steal this. Certainly, he's going to try to steal this. You know, as we speak, 
Uh, we're getting reports that his legal team is pursuing actions to halt the vote. He's complaining on Twitter a lot about how they're finding votes and counting them. That's part of the process. But he is going to try to rat fuck his way to victory. Will it work? That's yet to be seen. But we can at least eliminate one scenario. And that was Barton Gelman's scenario, where if it were close in a state that was controlled by Republicans, such as Florida, Trump can try to use his loyalists in that state to appoint their own electors to the Electoral College to flip the votes. The problem with this strategy, if Trump was in fact trying to pursue this, is that in states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, these are controlled by Democrats. They have Democratic governors. So he can't necessarily do this. So the best thing that he can do legally is try to stop the vote counting process. And they're already almost finished. So what it's looking like is if Trump is going to be successful at stealing this election, it's going to have to come from a recount and there's going to have to be some more votes that were there. We're going to have to bank on it being super inaccurate. That's really unlikely. So Trump's running out of options. And so all he can do now is create a lot of chaos to try to win. I mean, his tweets on Twitter, that is damaging. I mean, he warned just the other day that there's going to be violence in Pennsylvania. He was predicting this if they take a while to count the votes. So he knows what he's doing. This is a signal to his base to try to stir up chaos to stop the process. But again, he's losing his path. Now, a lot can change after this video, but still, it is looking very likely that Biden pulls this off. Now, we can't necessarily talk through a lot of the implications here being discussed because I don't want to bank too much of my, my commentary on exit polls, but there are some preliminary um, things we can talk about just right now. First and foremost, obviously, is that this was not a complete repudiation of Donald Trump which is unfortunate. As I stated before, Joe Biden, you know, he's a terrible candidate and doesn't deserve to win in a landslide, but Donald Trump deserved to lose in a landslide. And it's close. So this isn't a cl complete repudiation of Donald Trump and Trumpism and white supremacy and fascism. It's close. So what this means is that really this came down to Donald Trump bungling COVID-19. He didn't deliver, didn't even pretend to take it seriously. So right now, it seems as if Trump's failure there, not Trump himself, is ultimately uh, what I expect to be the reason why he uh, loses, if he does in fact lose and the results hold. Having said that though, Democrats... This is kind of a repudiation of their horrible strategy to court Republicans, because guess what? It seems as if there's not very many pro-Biden Republicans, and that strategy was a failure. And Democrats, I mean, it's honestly astonishing how poorly they campaigned. I mean, I get that Donald Trump also ran a terrible campaign, but we have to focus on Joe Biden and Democrats. This strategy, I mean, they are so lucky. If Joe Biden wins... Like, he's very lucky because he ran a terrible campaign. His team, I think rightfully so, hid him away for a lot of this process after the primary. And I think that's the right strategy because you don't want to put him in front of people and have him damage himself. But overall, that's not very inspiring. You have to have a message. And do we know what Joe Biden's message was overall? Restore the character of the nation? What does that mean? We all know why Joe Biden is as successful as he was because he's not Donald Trump. It's not about Joe Biden. There was no message that resonated with people. And we really have to look at the way that Donald Trump improved his numbers among people of color and also with LGBTQ plus folks. And I think that part of this is um, Democrats not doing enough to appeal to these types of marginalized communities. Um, but also Joe Biden, I mean, he there was a leak from his campaign that they didn't see Latinos as part of his path to victory. So was there no outreach? And I think that we know that in terms of just grassroots activism, Joe Biden didn't really have that. I mean, there were articles throughout the course of this race where, you know, Donald Trump was knocking on a million doors per week. His team was doing that and Biden wasn't doing anything. They were focusing more on digital organizing. And, you know, it, it seems as if it's a missed opportunity. Look, I don't want to be too down on Joe Biden now that we don't have the results. We don't necessarily know. I mean, 
he could still win Georgia, North Carolina, so maybe he does win more easily. We don't necessarily know yet, but it shouldn't have been this close still. It should have been a blowout in Florida. When you have someone like Donald Trump fumble in a pandemic and, and you know, a subsequent economic crash, I mean, this is an easy election. The incumbent always gets blamed, and Donald Trump made it very easy to pin blame on him. He was his own biggest enemy. So that's, that's a layup for Democrats, and they still fumbled. They probably lost the Senate. Now, again, we're speaking with uncertainty. I don't necessarily know. Uh, I hope they win the Senate, but it's a real plausible scenario right now at the time that I record this at almost 1 p.m. on the West Coast that Joe Biden could become president and Republicans retain control of the Senate with Mitch McConnell as Senate Majority Leader, meaning that not much is going to get accomplished. Another stimulus, very, very unlikely, which is why we were pushing for it to get done before the election. So Joe Biden, as president, even if he doesn't have control of the Senate, he can still accomplish quite a bit, right? He can sign executive orders, and he's going to have to be basically the executive order president until Democrats can possibly take back the Senate in 2022. But he can get us back into the Paris Climate Accord, the Iran nuclear deal. He can reinstate DACA. There are things that he can do, but in terms of really broad, you know, structural reforms that were even a possibility, that's eliminated if Republicans do, in fact, hold on to the Senate. So it's a situation where, you know, we got rid of Donald Trump, potentially, who is leading to a spike in COVID cases because he's not taking it seriously. I mean, yesterday we had over 90,000 new cases of coronavirus. That's astonishing. So, you know, Donald Trump lost, but at the same time, Democrats didn't necessarily do enough. I mean, Sarah Gideon lost to Susan Collins. Jamie Harrison lost to Lindsey Graham. Amy McGrath lost to Mitch McConnell. So, you know, we have to acknowledge that the strategy that Democrats were using to court Republicans has been a failure. But yet, you know, we see across the country, pot legalization passing, $15 minimum wage increase passed. Oregon voted to decriminalize all drugs that passed. So this isn't rocket science. Democrats know what they have to do and understand you are going to be very frustrated because you're going to hear Democratic Party strategists and pundits say, well, look, this just proves that we were right to court Republicans and centrism is, is the ticket to victory. They're not going to come away with the common sense conclusion, right? Um, so Democrats failed. However, I also want to point out that there is a reason why Americans are voting for Donald Trump in spite of how much of a disaster he's been. And I think a large part of that is propaganda, but I don't necessarily believe that that's, that's the entire explanation. I think that Americans do bear some responsibility here. I mean, yes, propaganda in corporate media is an issue, but the American people have to take responsibility. We have to reckon with the fact that there is a large portion of the American population that is comfortable with someone who is a white supremacist, pretty openly so, in the White House. Maybe they feel as if, you know, economically, Trump is better for them, and correctly so, unless they're wealthy. But still, they voted for him in spite of the fact that it's pretty obvious that he's a white supremacist. I mean, the other day at his campaign rally, with the way he was attacking Ilhan Omar, you would have assumed he would call for an ethno state, a white ethno state. So, you know, there is, you know, a degree of responsibility, personal responsibility, not to sound like a conservative, ironically, that we have to uh, look at with regard to the electorate. Sure, there's propaganda. It oftentimes, you know, corporate media will get Americans to vote against their own self-interest, as we saw with the um, ballot initiative in California with uh, Uber and Lyft. We'll talk about that in a, in, in a different video. But the American people also, even though Democrats failed them and the media failed them, who doesn't know that Trump is an obvious white supremacist? So we have to grapple with the reality that after watching Donald Trump boast about extrajudicially murdering an American civilian, being openly fascistic, cracking down on peaceful protesters, and straight up being a white supremacist, they're okay with it. And Trump increased the amount of support that he had with people of color. 
he doubled his support with LGBTQ plus people after appointing a Supreme Court justice who will almost certainly overturn Obergefell v. Hodges after banning trans people from serving in the military. So we have to try to, we, we have to balance what's happening here. We have to try to really do a thoughtful analysis about what's happening here. I think that we can blame the Democratic Party's failure, and we should. We can blame corporate media, and we should. But where's this disconnect coming from? Why are so many people voting against their own self-interests for someone who clearly doesn't care about them? Is it just, you know, a vote against the establishment? I think that, I think that now is the time to be introspective and try to figure out what's going on. And this may become more clear as we get more numbers in, right? Because we're, we're operating with incomplete information, so we can only make inferences, but maybe we don't have enough evidence to make really large leaps and take away any big conclusions. But currently, I mean, in theory, this shouldn't have been a close election. We should have expected it to be over on night one. Joe Biden should have won Florida. The fact that he didn't, the fact that Democrats were not able to take back the Senate after spending more than $100 million on these races, that speaks to a failure. You know, it's not a repudiation of Donald Trump so far based on what we're seeing now. But I think that it definitely is, this election is, a repudiation of Democrats' strategy to appeal to centrists. That's not working. And this isn't rocket science. So you have to give people a reason to vote. Again, you know, that anti-Trump fervor in this country helped propel Joe Biden to victory if he does in fact win. But that's not enough. And you know the answer. Legal weed. Medicare for all. I mean, this this isn't... This isn't rocket science. Democrats are trying to play 4D chess, but meanwhile, they're hurting themselves when they try to appeal to people on the margins. Like we we knew more about Joe Biden's stance on fracking and how he doesn't want to ban it than we did about his actual climate change policy, which wasn't as bad as it was during the primaries. He improved it. He actually did speak with people from the Sunrise Movement, and it's not as good as Bernie's policy, but it was still better. He made an improvement but yet we didn't hear about that. We only heard that he doesn't want to ban fracking. You have to connect the dots for voters. You have to do better. So there's a lot, uh, you know, and my thoughts are somewhat jumbled because this is all new information that I'm trying to process. But I mean, either way, uh, Republicans and Democrats have to be introspective and, you know, they have to try to figure out what happened. And I think that the explanation for Donald Trump's fail is definitely COVID-19, which means that I think he probably would have been easily reelected had it not been for this pandemic and the subsequent economic crash. But when it comes to Democrats, I mean, I think that this basically is confirmation that the left is right. And Joe Biden was not the most electable candidate. Bernie Sanders did really well with Latino voters. Joe Biden did not. Bernie had enthusiasm with young voters. Joe Biden did not. So, you know, there's a lot that we have to look at, but I think that it is important for all of us to be introspective, look at where we were right, where we were wrong, and don't be afraid to admit that maybe this strategy failed, but that strategy was a success. Like, this isn't a perfect uh, thing. Like, it, like, there's no right or wrong answer, really, but I think there are some common sense um, conclusions that we can immediately draw, and that is that Democrats should have done better. They should have won back the Senate. The fact that they did not shows that their strategy has not worked, even going up against the monster like Donald Trump. But again, this is all, you know, me speaking with incomplete information. I don't have the full results. I will continue to make videos and update you. But this is basically my first post-election day video explaining my thoughts. And um, this is going to be either a really long, drawn-out week, or we could know by today that, uh, you know, Joe Biden crosses 270. We don't know. But um, I think that we, we need to all just take a moment, step back, just breathe, try not to panic, and acknowledge that, you know, this red mirage, the uh, Trump, uh, uh, Trump attempt to st steal this election, this was all expected. You know, so um, can he do that? We're going to wait and see. But right now, um, you know, uh, we'll just buckle up and uh, see what's going to happen. It appears Joe Biden's going to win. But it's not over yet, because Donald Trump will be an angry lame duck president until January 21st. That is going to be um, a nightmare. So, lots happening. Uh, stay tuned.
For months, there has been this fear that Donald Trump would not accept the results of the election. And predictably, now that Joe Biden is leading, seems as if he is on the cusp of clinching 270 electoral votes, Donald Trump is doing what we all expected him to do, not accept the results of the election and cry foul. Claim that he's actually the winner and Joe Biden is only in the lead because the Democrats committed fraud. Now, I'm going to explain to you how Donald Trump is trying to steal this election. Now, that's the worst case scenario. At a minimum, he at least wants to have some sort of damage control. So that way, if he does lose, he didn't lose because of his own failure. He lost because the Democrats cheated. But if he can somehow use this claim of fraud to tilt it in his direction, that's what he wants to do. Now, of course, this has been a months-long effort by Donald Trump to lie about mail-in ballots and claim that they will lead to fraud. And there is two reasons why he's been claiming that mail-in ballots will lead to fraud. The first reason is so that way, in the event, a red mirage did happen, and it did. Well, he can declare victory and claim that all of the mail-in ballots that are coming in that heavily favor Joe Biden, that is evidence that Democrats are cheating. Now, it's not necessarily a shocker that more mail-in ballots favor Joe Biden after for months he told his supporters who believe him that mail-in ballots lead to fraud. So why would they want to vote by mail after you told them not to trust mail-in ballots? So it's not surprising, but I mean, this is all part of the plan. Now, the second element, he appointed Postmaster General Louis DeJoy to control the U.S. Postal Service. Now, what this means is that he can use his crony to slow down the process, slow down the delivery of ballots, give himself the advantage, make sure that his voters know not to vote by mail because all of those Democrats that are going to vote by mail, we're going to slow down that process, make sure that their ballots don't get delivered on time. So it was a months long ploy that contains two elements, him lying and prematurely declaring victory when he wasn't in the lead. Yet, when he didn't have enough electoral votes to claim victory, and two, absolutely crippling the U.S. Postal Service to make sure that mail-in ballots aren't effective. So we're going to talk about his attempt to steal this election in two parts. The first is him using the Red Mirage to declare victory. So last night, this is what he said when he had not been declared the winner, but because it appeared as if he was in the lead, well, to him... That warranted him claiming victory. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. So our goal now is to ensure the integrity for the good of this nation. This is a very big moment. This is a major fraud in our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and add them to the list, okay? It's, it's a very sad, it's a very sad moment. To me, this is a very sad moment. And we will win this, and we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. So, I so what he's basically saying is, I'm ahead right now, stop the counts. Because he knows that if the count continues, if we count all of the mail-in ballots, well, those are going to heavily favor Joe Biden because he told his supporters not to vote by mail. So he's saying, I don't want the votes to be counted. Now, he also took to Twitter to double down on this claim of fraud, saying, how come every time they count mail-in ballot dumps, they are so devastating in their percentage and power of destruction? They are working hard to make up 500,000 vote advantage in Pennsylvania disappear. ASAP, likewise Michigan and others. We are winning Pennsylvania big, but the PA Secretary of State just announced that there are millions of ballots left to be counted. So he's insinuating that it's weird and nefarious that as more and more of these mail-in ballots get counted, well, Joe Biden tends to overtake him. But this shouldn't be weird. After for months, you have told your supporters 
don't vote by mail. Mail-in ballots lead to fraud. So if they don't trust the system, then it shouldn't be a surprise to Donald Trump that more Democrats who are less likely to believe him are going to vote by mail. But he knows exactly what's happening. This is all part of the process because, you know, he is using this, his diminishing lead, to cry fraud about mail-in ballots and use some sort of legal fight to at least slow down the process. And now we have this news. As AP reports, Trump's team is suing Pennsylvania and Michigan and asking for the counting to be halted until his campaign officials gain access to the process. And he's seeking a recount in Wisconsin. So his best hope here is to try to slow down the process. But what he's hoping for, with regard to Pennsylvania at least, is to invalidate lots of ballots. Because before he was able to confirm his Supreme Court nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, to the Supreme Court, well, it was a 4-4 decision. They were gridlocked. And basically what they determined is that ballots that come in after November 3rd that are postmarked for November 3rd, those are counted. Now, knowing that those are mail-in ballots that would heavily favor Joe Biden, this was not good for Donald Trump who wants to stop those votes from being counted. So now he's trying to create a legal battle that goes quickly to the Supreme Court in hopes that Amy Coney Barrett will now end the gridlock and vote in his favor 5-4. So that way, any ballots that were received in Pennsylvania late, they don't actually get counted, which means he's trying to actively invalidate ballots. Now, while all this is taking place, while his legal team tries to at least slow down this process, his supporters are doing exactly what he wants them to do, exactly what we expected them to do. Because as NBC News reporter explains, large animated crush of Stop the Count protesters are trying to push their way into TCF Hall in Detroit, where ballots are being counted. They're being blocked by guards at the door. Pizza boxes are pushed against the window to obstruct the view. It's tense. And here's a video of what's happening. <laughs> Now remember, even though we know that Donald Trump's claims of fraud were expected and are false, they believe Donald Trump. Donald Trump is saying that these mail-in ballots, they're fraud. You know, I was I was in the lead at first, and all of a sudden, they seem to be finding more ballots for Joe Biden. There's something nefarious is going on. So when he says that, they believe him. They're there because they genuinely believe that this election is being stolen from Donald Trump. And this isn't the only place where this is happening. You see other people lashing out feeling as if this election that Donald Trump claims he won is being stolen before their very eyes. As I mentioned, we are not prepared to give that number. The Biden crime family steals the election! The media is covering up! The Biden crime family steals this election! The media is covering it up! The Biden crime family steals this election! The media is covering up! We want our freedom for the world! Give us our freedom, Joe Biden! Joe Biden is covering up this election! He's stealing it! So even though you and I might know that when Donald Trump talks about how fraudulent mail-in ballots are, he's blatantly lying, his supporters trust him. And they are reacting how we would expect someone to act if they genuinely believed that an election is being stolen, that this is a coup. But in actuality, this is all Donald Trump's attempt to delegitimize this election in hopes that he can win somehow use this legal process to stop the counts, which is tough to do when they're already almost finished, or at least invalidate as many ballots as possible in Pennsylvania if Amy Coney Barrett does in fact, you know, rule his way if this reaches the Supreme Court. But all of this, like this attempt to invalidate and delegitimize this election, this was just a backup plan. Because really what Trump has been wanting to do is basically destroy the U.S. Postal Service using his crony, Louis DeJoy.
This was his main plan. And as the Washington Post reports, nearly 7% of ballots in U.S. Postal Service sorting facilities on Tuesday were not processed on time for submission to election officials, according to data the agency filed Wednesday in federal court, potentially leaving tens of thousands of ballots caught in the mail system during an especially tight presidential race. The Postal Service reported the timely processing, which includes most mail handling steps outside of pickup and delivery, of 93.3% of ballots on Election Day, its best processing score in several days, but still well below the 97% target that postal and voting experts say the agency should hit. The Postal Service processed 115,630 ballots on Tuesday, a volume much lower than in recent days after weeks of warnings about chronic mail delays. Of that number, close to 8,000 ballots were not processed on time. A small proportion, but one that could factor heavily in states such as Michigan and Wisconsin, which do not accept ballots after Election Day and could be decided by a few thousand votes. Earlier Tuesday, U.S. District Judge Emmett Sullivan of the District of Columbia had ordered the Postal Service to sweep 12 postal processing facilities that cover 15 states for ballots, but the agency rebuffed that order and said it would stick to its own inspection schedule, which voting rights advocates worried was too late in the day for found ballots to make it to vote counters. The directive came after the Postal Service disclosed that more than 300,000 ballots nationwide could not be traced. Those ballots received entry barcode scans at processing facilities, but not exit scans. The agency said the likelihood of that many ballots being misplaced was very low. Mail clerks had been ordered to sort ballots by hand in many locations, and items that were pulled out for expedited delivery were not given an exit scan. So in addition to them not delivering these ballots in time, they are reporting that 300,000 ballots across the country are just lost. Take a look at this map. As you see in Pennsylvania, Arizona, Florida, Thousands of ballots were reported missing in these states, crucial battleground states. And again, this does not include the ballots that were not delivered on time. These are just the ballots that are missing. And as a result of this, Louis DeJoy is uh, in trouble because as NBC News legal analyst Glenn Kirshner reports, Judge Sullivan is hauling USPS back into court at noon on November 4th to address its apparent noncompliance with his court order. Of paramount importance, getting 300,000 ballots delivered. DeJoy's crimes must not be allowed to thwart delivery and counting of all ballots. So what we are seeing is the culmination of a months-long strategy by Donald Trump to use mail-in ballots to try to steal this election, or at least tilt it in his favor. Number one, you make sure that your postmaster general, who is loyal to you, make sure that those ballots don't get out on time, or at least not all of them get out on time, which means that Democrats who disproportionately are more likely to vote by mail will be harmed by this. And for the ballots that do get delivered on time, assuming they weren't lost, you try to halt the process like stop them from being counted literally that's what his team is trying to do now they may not be able to do it i think maybe legally they know they can't really do that so they're just trying to slow down the process slow it down so they can try to figure out what to do next slow it down and say we need to get our observers in there because currently this looks really fishy this is exactly what we expected would happen it's basically the worst case scenario playing out before our very eyes Trump is trying to delegitimize this election and he's working his supporters into a frenzy to where they are now showing up to the places where ballots are being counted and demanding that those ballots not be counted because they believe that this is a fraudulent process. This is really dangerous. If Joe Biden does in fact clinch 270, Trump is trying to make it seem as if he did not win legitimately. And that's not great for a country who is incredibly polarized and divided currently. So this is Trump's plan. He wants to steal this election or at a minimum delegitimize the results. And this is a direct attack on democracy. We'll call it what it is. It's a, an attack on democracy. So last night we saw the red mirage play out. The scenario where Donald Trump would appear to be in the lead, but then as mail-in ballots come in and they are counted, that lead diminishes. And a couple of weeks ago, Bernie Sanders appeared on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, and he predicted all of this would happen with pinpoint accuracy. So I can't play the video clip for you because there's probably going to be some copyright issues, but here's the audio of Bernie Sanders basically saying exactly 
what happened. The election uh, is November 3rd, and it's been said that we won't know the results until days later. W when do you think we'll know the results? All right. Jimmy, you raise an important point, and I hope the American people understand it, because this is something I worry about. My view is every vote must be counted. For reasons which I don't have the time to get into tonight, you're going to have a situation, I suspect, in states like Pennsylvania, um, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, other states, where they are going to be receiving huge amounts of mail-in ballots. And unlike states like Florida or Vermont, they're not being able, for bad reasons, to begin processing those ballots until, I don't know, election day or maybe when the polls close. That means you're going to have states dealing with perhaps millions of mail-in ballots. Here is my worry. What polls show and what studies have shown is that for whatever reason, Democrats are more likely to use mail-in ballots. Republicans are more likely to walk into polling booths on election day. It is likely that the first votes that will be counted will be those people who came in on election day, which will be Republican. And here is the fear, and I hope everybody hears that. It could well be, and you know, I don't know what's gonna happen, nobody does, but it could well be that at 10 o'clock on election night, Trump is winning in Michigan, He's winning in Pennsylvania. He's winning in Wisconsin. And he gets on the television. He says, thank you, Americans, for reelecting me. It's all over. Have a good day. But then the next day and the day following, all of those mail-in ballots start getting counted. And it turns out that Biden has won those states, at which point Trump says, see, I told you the whole thing was fraudulent. I told you those mail-in ballots were crooked. And I got, you know, we're not going to leave office. So that is a worry that I and, I and a lot of people have. So the results, you know, we don't know what's happened. Maybe sure. the results will be on our election day. So Bernie Sanders was accurate down to a T. And I'm not showing you this video to toot Bernie Sanders' horn and make it seem as if, you know, he's some psychic. Because really, the scenario that we all expected, even though it was kind of a more worst case scenario, it still played out exactly as we thought it would. Trump appeared to be in the lead, he declared victory, and then as the mail-in ballots come in, he's losing that lead. Because Democrats, for whatever reason, as Bernie Sanders pointed out, are more likely to vote by mail. Republicans, not so much. That's more explainable. Because Republicans have been told for months now by Donald Trump that vote by mail leads to fraud. So, of course, they're going to show up to vote in person. But Democrats, not necessarily believing Donald Trump, probably worrying about the pandemic, not wanting to vote in person, they voted by mail. So we're seeing everything play out exactly as uh, we expected. But I'm not showing you this to tell you how right Bernie Sanders was. I I'm playing this for you because it's really important that we all get this on the record. We show Donald Trump supporters right now, who probably won't believe us, but maybe some will, that this is not fraud. This is ex exactly what we expected. This is not a nefarious ploy by Democrats to steal this election using mail-in ballots that just inexplicably appear out of nowhere if, Donald, if Joe Biden is down. If that were the case, wouldn't it be happening in Florida? Wouldn't it be happen, happening in states that he needed to win but didn't? So we have to show them that this is something that we expected based on data, not feelings, based on what voting habits are. Democrats, more likely to vote by mail. Republicans, not. Now, this varies depending on the state, depending on the demographic. But by and large, Democrats were more likely to vote by mail. So Donald Trump was going to use this to his advantage to delegitimize the results of this election. And knowing that Democrats more so would vote by mail, we saw what he did throughout the summer. His postmaster general, Louis DeJoy, crippled the U.S. Postal Service. And when they were supposed to get at least 97% of ballots delivered on Tuesday. They only hit 93%. And now we're learning that 300,000 mail-in ballots are missing. So if there's any attempt to steal this election going on, it's not Joe Biden and the Democrats. It's Donald Trump, who is using the institutional power that he has as an incumbent to do everything. To not only delegitimize the process, but use our government in his favor to win. 
So it's important that we show people that this is predicted. It's not some sudden plan to steal this election away from Donald Trump. If Donald Trump won legitimately, I have no doubt that Democrats and Democratic Party voters would accept the results. But because Donald Trump is a baby, because there are reports that he literally threw a temper tantrum as he saw the results come in, well, he uh, is going to bring the entire country down with him. Make sure that his voters, you know, uh, believe him and they cause chaos. Like, he, he wants to make sure that if he, if he loses this election, he gives us, you know, that one last fuck you. And look, he's not immediately out of office. It's going to be a long two months between now and January 21st when he leaves office if he does, in fact, lose. And uh, I promise you he's going to make it in, as insufferable as possible to punish us for not voting for him. Buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride, folks. Look, things can change very fast in this race, and it is very possible that by the time you see this video, a winner will have already been declared. Either Joe Biden or Donald Trump may have already reached 270 electoral votes. So what I'm going to talk about, it captures one moment in time. And as I record this video, Joe Biden is currently in the lead. He has 264 total electoral votes, and all he needs is six more. If he pulls ahead in Georgia, that'll do it. If he wins Nevada, which he's currently leading in, that'll do it. He may not even need Pennsylvania. So as it stands right now, it looks as if Joe Biden is going to become the next president of the United States. That can change. However, at this moment in time, Donald Trump is seeing what we're all seeing, and he's freaking out. He is utterly melting down, and we expected this. And part of me wants to laugh because, you know, to see someone who caused so much harm and damage to this country finally see the consequences of his actions, it's nice to see. It feels nice. At the same time, however, what he's doing is dangerous. The things that he's saying, what he is doing to get his supporters to watch the polls, try to get the votes to stop, this is dangerous. This is undemocratic. And even though it's nice to see him suffer a little bit after so many Americans have, have suffered under his watch, at the end of the day, this is all horrible. I would rather him act like an adult and accept the results of this election as Joe Biden would. Uh, but he's not. And um, he is throwing temper tantrums. Literally, people close to Trump are confirming that he was watching those results come in and throwing literal temper tantrums. Um, you've been working the phones. What was going on this, behind the scenes at the White House? So as a Republican source said to me, this is a, a senior official who is normally an ally of the president said that Trump had a temper tantrum last night, that he saw that the numbers could start going against him, that he wanted to declare victory while he thought that he was ahead. And this, you know, as you've been saying, John, this was not a surprise to us. The White House had been sort of forecasting for weeks that this might happen. But here's the thing. We know how to count votes, as you've been pointing out all morning. What the president did last night was so chaos, confusion, uh, undermine democracy. And I will tell you, the Republicans I spoke to this morning are not happy with him. Let me read three quotes from three different officials. The first person said he is behaving as expected badly. The second person said that Trump is afraid of mail-in ballots. And the third person said that what he said last night was, quote, indefensible. And, and just to reiterate, there is no evidence that we have seen of fraud. Uh, these states are just trying to count the vote, no matter what Donald Trump said at 2.30 in the morning. A grown man in his 70s throwing temper tantrums. I mean, it's not surprising, but to literally have that be reported, which I believe is, is still, it's something, right? Now, to all of the Republicans who are quietly criticizing Donald Trump and, you know, anonymously taking shots at him, saying that he should behave himself, I have no respect for these people. You should go on the record. If you actually care about democracy, you should actually 
say that what he's doing is terrible. In fact, someone who I probably agree with on nothing, Ben Shapiro, even he has enough integrity to admit that when Donald Trump declared himself the winner last night, that was dangerous and irresponsible. So it, it doesn't matter. Like This isn't about whether or not you're Democrat or Republican or where you lean ideologically speaking. This is about democracy. And everyone, regardless of their political ideology or party affiliation, should care about democracy. So any Republican who's not speaking up and condemning Donald Trump's blatant attempt to delegitimize this election and steal it away by stopping the counts, I mean, they're, they're cowards. And I don't even know, like, Trump supporters currently are showing up to places in Wisconsin and, and Michigan, as far as I know. I'm not sure how many states this is happening in, but they're chanting, stop the count. Stop the vote. Like, you have to understand that it, as it stands now, if they stop the votes, Joe Biden wins. So do you want democracy to actually play out? Do you want the votes to be counted or do you not? Because if I'm Donald Trump, I want the votes to be counted, especially in states where, you know, it hasn't been called yet, like Nevada at the time I record this. Now, what's interesting is that Michigan was already called hours ago. And after it was called, Donald Trump took the Twitter to declare victory in states that have not been called for him, in states that have been called for Joe Biden, like Michigan. He tweeted out, We have claimed for electoral vote purposes the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which won't allow legal observers, the state of Georgia, and the state of North Carolina, each one of which has a big Trump lead. Additionally, we hereby claim the state of Michigan if, in fact, there was a large number of secretly dumped ballots, as has been widely reported. Now again, Michigan has been called for Joe Biden. You did not win this, so it doesn't matter what you say. It went to Joe Biden. Um, and he's talking about a secretly, uh, a large number of secretly dumped ballots that has been widely reported. Where? Zero evidence for this. The only shenanigans that's happening is occurring because of you. Because your postmaster general is intentionally trying to sabotage mail-in ballots, only delivering 93% of mail-in ballots on election day, missing thousands of mail-in ballots across the country. But yet, he's claiming it's Democrats who are the ones who are trying to cheat and steal this election after he's been fear-mongering about mail-in ballots and trying to sabotage mail-in ballots instructing his supporters to not vote by mail while he sabotages the system that Democrats will most likely use to vote. But it's Democrats who are stealing the election, not Donald Trump. Fuck out of here. So as he throws this temper tantrum, like, I hope he really feels horrible right now. Shame on him for just blatantly undermining democracy. This is what dictators do. This is what authoritarian regimes do. And we have a president who refuses to concede, most likely, if it is in fact called for Joe Biden. We have a president who is refusing to accept that the state of Michigan did not go his way. And on top of that, what he's encouraging among his supporters who believe everything he says is even more dangerous. His campaign sent out this email. The Democrats will try to steal this election, just like I predicted from the start. Mail-in ballots are leading to chaos like you've never seen, plain and simple. The radical left is going to do whatever it takes to try and rip a Trump-Pence victory away from you. And that's why I'm coming to you now. I need your help to ensure we have the resources to protect the results. We can't allow the left-wing mob to undermine our election. I'm asking my fiercest and most loyal defenders like you to fight back. Now, we don't have the full screenshot of that email. I'm not on his email list. So the person who shared this cropped out where he then asked for money. So he's not explicitly saying fight back, go do violence. He's asking fight back by giving us money so we can fight this legally, just for context. However, the language that he is using is still deeply, deeply undemocratic and troubling. He's saying Democrats are trying to steal this election. Mail-in ballots are causing chaos like we've never seen. And some words, like the language that he's choosing to use very specifically and intentionally, are designed to make his supporters take action, as they are now. He refers to the left-wing mob and wants them to fight back. And even though he has plausible deniability because the way that they're saying uh, they should fight back is by giving them money, I mean, these words are very, very explosive. He's saying right now, explicitly so, they're trying to steal this. This is fraudulent. So even if he, you know, didn't say, give me money, what he's saying here, this is undemocratic. He's trying to delegitimize this election because it's not going his way. 
So this is, um, it's partially funny because his meltdown is, um, is fun to watch in a way, but it's still terrifying to watch because this is now an incumbent president. This isn't an outsider who has not yet secured power. This is an incumbent president who has power, who will be a lame duck president if he in fact loses until January 21st. So imagine the chaos he's going to cause between now and then. Ugh. It's uh, it's going to be a long journey and I am already exhausted, so I can't imagine how we will all be feeling come January. But, you know, this is this is what we've got. It seems like Joe Biden's going to win. And if, uh, you know, everything goes the way it's looking right now with Nevada leaning Biden, it's over for Trump. So one way or another, he's going to have to accept the results. He can try to steal it if he wants to, but you don't get to deny reality. As Ben Shapiro would say, facts don't care about your feelings. So regardless of what you say, how loud you cry and scream, how violent your supporters may get, the person who will win is the person who got the most votes. Period. End of story. And we will count those votes. Fuck your feelings. The votes get counted. If you don't like that, that's democracy for you. Sometimes it goes your way. Sometimes it doesn't. In 2016, Donald Trump won. I didn't like that. Liberals didn't like that. Socialists didn't like that. And we were mad. But we couldn't overturn the fucking results. As a Bernie Sanders supporter, Democrats all united to stop Bernie Sanders. Obama made some calls to Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar. And uh, everyone dropped out to back Biden to consolidate the vote. We lost that election. It sucks. But that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Can't do jack shit about it right now. Can't cry over spilled milk. All you can do is get better at organizing, appeal to more voters. You can be mad at Donald Trump for completely bungling COVID-19 because had he actually handled this pandemic like a grown-up, he probably would still be the president. Probably wouldn't even be close. I think had it not been for COVID-19 and the subsequent economic crash, Donald Trump would have won easily. He would have beat someone like Joe Biden who nobody is enthusiastic about. So, I mean, look, it doesn't matter what Trump says. The results are the results. They're not what he says they are. They're what they are in actuality, what reality dictates, what we can see with our eyes, what the votes say. So we count the votes. If you don't like that, too fucking bad. That's democracy. For months now, I have been bringing progressive after progressive after progressive on this program in an effort to expand the squad and get them elected. Every single Saturday, I usually have a brand new congressional candidate to introduce you to. And quite a bit of them saw success. They won their Democratic Party primaries. And on Tuesday night, we had more than 30 progressives up for election. Now, I'm not including the progressives who are already incumbents. Pramila Jayapal, Katie Porter, Ro Khanna, Barbara Lee, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Ayanna Presley. we're not including them. So when I say there were 30 progressives up for election, I'm referring to new progressives who, if elected, would be adding to our numbers in Congress, expanding the block of left-wing people in Congress. So the question is, how many of them actually were successful? How many of the progressives who won their Democratic Party primaries were successful? Well, I'll be honest with you, I was disappointed with the results, but it's not its not all bad. There were some really important key victories, but we lost a lot of big names, and that's disappointing to me. And there were a lot of key races that didn't go as we suspected. So there's a lot, there's some puzzling congressional victories in here that we're going to talk about, but first of all, we're going to get to all of the progressive congressional candidates that lost. And since there were so many, I can't go through and give you the breakdowns as to, you know, the margin and how big the loss was. I'm just going to name all of the progressives that lost. And that list, unfortunately, is huge. So that includes Nate McMurray running in New York's 27th congressional district, Adam Christensen running in Florida's 3rd congressional district, Adrian Bell, running in the 14th Congressional District of Texas. Antonia Ilyasin, running in Mississippi's 1st Congressional District. 
Audrey Denny, running in California's 1st Congressional District, Beth Doglio, running in Washington's 10th Congressional District, Kathy Kunkel, running in West Virginia's 2nd Congressional District, Christine Olivo, running in Florida's 24th Congressional District, Cindy Banyai, running in Florida's 19th Congressional District, Dana Allen Ferguson, running in Michigan's 1st Congressional District, Donna Imam, running in Texas's 31st Congressional District, Georgette Gomez, running in California's 53rd Congressional District, Hillary Turner, running in West Virginia's 3rd Congressional District, John Headley, running in Michigan's 6th Congressional District, Julie Oliver, running in the 25th Congressional District of Texas, Kara Eastman, running in Nebraska's 2nd Congressional District, Kathy Ellis, running in the 8th Congressional District of Missouri, Kim Nelson, running in South Carolina's 4th Congressional District, District, Liam O'Mara, running in California's 42nd Congressional District, Mia Mason, running in Maryland's 1st Congressional District, Mike Siegel, running in Texas's 10th Congressional District, Nick Rabondo, running in Ohio's 5th Congressional District, Qasem Rashid, running in Virginia's 1st Congressional District, Ray Lindsay, running in Illinois's 12th Congressional District, and last but certainly not least, Shahid Buttar, running in California's 12th Congressional District against Nancy Pelosi. All of these progressives lost. And some of these hurt really bad. To where when I saw the results, it was like a gut punch. And when I say that these are progressives, these are progressives. I saw a lot of graphics being spread online about all of these progressive races to look out for. And when I say that these are progressives, I am telling you I spent countless hours vetting each and every single one of these individuals to ensure that these are actually progressive people. They were either endorsed by Justice Democrats or a brand new Congress or endorsed by someone like Bernie Sanders. And more importantly, the policies on their page were displayed clearly and explicitly. I saw, you know, confirmation that they support either Medicare for all or single, single payer. If I see any rhetoric relating to expanding access to health care, I don't count them as a progressive. So these individuals are just the ones that are progressive. And these ones lost. And that's really disappointing. Now, having said that, it wasn't all bad. There were some victories. First of all, 85% of DSA endorsed candidates running at the local level in states across the country won their races. This is according to the Gravel Institute. This is excellent news. Now, in terms of who won, of course, all of the incumbent progressives, they won easily. We're talking about the entire squad. Katie Porter, Ro Khanna, Pramila Jayapal, they all won. Now, who are the new progressives that will be going to Congress? How many new members of the squad will there be? Well, um, it's not a lot, but it's still, it's still important. We're looking at potentially five new members of the squad, four confirmed one hanging in the balance in a race that has not been called. So, who is hanging in the balance currently? Well, in the 34th Congressional District of California, David Kim is currently facing off against Democratic incumbent Jimmy Gomez. David Kim is a progressive. And currently, with 77% of precincts reporting, Jimmy Gomez is leading 52.6 to 47.4. So, it is not over yet. There are still more votes to be counted. We could have a progressive oust an incumbent corporate Democrat. If David Kim pulls this off, he will unquestionably be a very progressive member of the squad. I had him on the program. I was thoroughly impressed. Basically, if you take Marianne Williamson, Andrew Yang, and Bernie Sanders, and you squash them all together into one candidate, you get David Kim. If he wins this, if he pulls this out, this is huge news. Now, we did get four confirmed victories. The first one is Cori Bush. Now, this was expected, but nonetheless, it still is really important. In the 1st Congressional District of Missouri, Cori Bush defeated her Republican opponent, Anthony Rogers, by a landslide. We're talking almost 50 points. This is huge. In New York's 16th Congressional District, Jamal Bowman defeated his Republican opponent, Patrick McNamus, also in a landslide, 83 to 17%. Phenomenal win when it comes to the 3rd Congressional District of Illinois. Marie Newman, who ousted conservative Democrat Dan Lipinski, 
she defeated her Republican opponent 53.2 to 46.8. When it comes to the 17th Congressional District of New York, Mondaire Jones defeated his Republican opponent 47.5 to 44.1 with 35% of precincts reporting, although this race has been called for Mondaire Jones, so it was close. But it seems as if there is enough confidence to assert that there is going to be a Mondaire Jones victory. I'm not sure of the criteria, but it's been called and um, he won. So that is four, possibly five new progressives that will be going to Congress. And when they do go to Congress, they will be just as loud and unapologetically progressive as AOC, as Ilhan Omar. Will they be perfect? No. Will we disagree with them and be disappointed in their votes from time to time? Yes, but this is a victory for us. This is a huge victory. And my favorite of all of these, um, it's going to be a tie between David Kim and Cori Bush. Um, Cori Bush really is just, she's a phenomenal candidate. I think one of the best congressional candidates running in the country. So the fact that she made it and she will be a member of Congress, this is honestly this is huge for the movement. Um, now, having said that, there's more than just the House races. Um, there were some really important races for the U.S. Senate. In terms of progressives, we had two that I was watching very closely. Paula Jean Swearingen in West Virginia going up against the Republican incumbent Shelley Moore Capito. Unfortunately, Paula Jean Swearingen lost. That was a hard pill to swallow. That was, that was tough. Now, another one is Marquita Bradshaw in Tennessee. Unfortunately, she did not win. Another one is Lisa Savage, a Green Party candidate running in Maine who had a shot because of Maine's ranked choice voting system. Unfortunately, Lisa Savage did not win. And also, Susan Collins was re-elected, so the Democrat didn't win there either. But other key races, not necessarily progressive people, but individuals who were running against high-profile Republicans. Um, Amy McGrath, to no one's surprise, she lost to Mitch McConnell. What is it, more than $100 million wasted, went up in flames, and she ran a terrible campaign. Amy McGrath lost to Mitch McConnell. He won in a landslide. So the most destructive member of the Senate will likely remain in control of the Senate, assuming Republicans retain control of the Senate. So that's awful. Um, additionally, Jamie Harrison, not a progressive by any stretch of the imagination, but I was hoping he would pull out a victory against Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham clung to power. Now, John Ossoff is someone who I think ran a good campaign against David Perdue. I was dunking on him back in uh, back in Georgia before when he ran in, I think, 2017 in the special election. Uh, but he stepped up. He's better, still not a progressive. I mean, we're still waiting on results in Georgia, so we can't say anything about this race yet. John Hickenlooper, though, he did defeat Cory Gardner, and this is the guy who ran for president who watched porn with his mom. So uh, he's going to Congress for whatever reason. I mean, I'm glad that John Hickenlooper defeated Cory Gardner, but it's like, was there not anyone else in the entire state of Colorado that could have run in place of John Hickenlooper? Really? John Hickenlooper? Uh, 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 a, uh, We've got to do better, Democrats. What are we doing? Why are we running people like this who have zero charisma, zero policy ideas? Like, what's what's the end goal here? Just to hang on to power forever and make sure that the left and progressives are, like, perpetually dissatisfied? Like, what are we doing? Now, there were a couple of races that are going to make you um, scratch your head a little bit. I'm talking about some right-wingers who won. Um, now, first of all, the good news. Uh, Laura Loomer, she lost. Wasn't expected to win because this was a district that leaned heavily in uh, favor of Democrats. But the Republican Party has some new individuals who I am assuming they will trot out as uh, rising stars in the Republican Party. I'm referring to two QAnoners and one Nazi who got elected to Congress. Madison Cawthorn, he was elected, and the first thing that he said was cry more libs or something to that, that effect. I mean, this is a member of Congress now talking about owning the libs. Brilliant. Now, I've talked about him before. The dude is a dunce. He has zero policy ideas. Doesn't know what he's talking about. Somehow won against a Trump-backed candidate. He wasn't expected to win, but now he's going to go to Congress. He's been accused of sexual assault. He, uh, again, is a Nazi, so that's great. 
Good job, Republicans. You elected a Nazi. Okay? Now, QAnon has got two members of Congress now. Laura Boebert got elected to Congress in Colorado's 3rd Congressional District, and perhaps the craziest of all Republican candidates running in this cycle, which is uh, a really high bar to pass, Marjorie Taylor Greene in Georgia's 14th Congressional District defeated the Democrat by almost 50 points. It was not even close. It was a landslide. So, on one hand, we did elect some more progressives, not nearly as much as I wanted. But, on another hand, a Nazi and two QAnoners will be going to Congress. I mean, the Republican Party is so irredeemable, so beyond the pale, that they are now literally electing members of a conspiracy cult and people who have an affinity for Adolf Hitler. If that doesn't tell you how far gone they are, nothing will. So we need to stop talking about the radical left and start actually talking about how the radical right truly is off the spectrum. The Republican Party is now the Donald Trump party. Even if Donald Trump loses, I mean, this party is now openly embracing fascism and conspiracy theories. And it's just, uh, it's not shocking. I was going to say shocking, but it's not really shocking. It's just disappointing. So overall, you know, um, Democrats did not take back the Senate. The House, Democrats lost a little bit of ground so far based on what we know uh, with preliminary results. So they're actually discussing possibly a leadership change. Will that happen? Will Nancy Pelosi actually relinquish power or will she try to uh, back everyone into a corner and try to force her way back into a leadership role again after she has been a proven failure? We'll wait and see, but at least we can look forward to Cori Bush, Jamal Bowman, Mondaire Jones, um, possibly David Kim and Marie Newman in Congress serving alongside members of the squad. So that's something that's genuinely exciting to look forward to. But um, overall, for congressional candidates, not the best results. And I think that once we really see all of the votes counted, we need to talk about whether or not the lack of enthusiasm for Joe Biden hurt down-ballot Democrats. And we're not just talking about progressives. We're talking about corporate Democrats everywhere. I mean, Jamie Harrison lost. Amy McGrath lost. Democrats, centrist and progressive, lost. Is Joe Biden not being, you know, um, a good enough candidate part to do with this? I, I mean, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But for now... I'm a little bit disappointed, to say the least, but, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, I was hoping for some surprise victories here, but maybe next time, maybe next time. We're doing better each election cycle. I just hope that, you know, um, by 2022, we'll have even more victories. So I want to take some time to talk through the ballot initiatives that we saw take place in certain states. We had some really interesting things up for a vote, and some of the results were really inspiring and groundbreaking and revolutionary in some ways, and other results, not so much. They were disappointing and, uh, quite frankly, perplexing, if I'm being honest. Uh, so let's get to the good first of all, because uh, there's a lot to celebrate. I don't want to be a doomer, so right off the bat, I'm going to hit you with some really good news. Four states voted to legalize recreational marijuana. Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, and South Dakota, which means that we now have a total of 15 states plus D.C. that have fully legal recreational marijuana. So the tide is turning. The domino effect is happening. It started with uh, Colorado and Washington State back in 2012. And little by little, every single election, more and more states vote to legalize recreational marijuana. It's been highly successful. And this is going to be a thing in all 50 states. I believe Mississippi actually passed medical marijuana. But at this point, when we have so many states that have legal recreational marijuana, I find it hard to celebrate that. But I'll take whatever progress that we can get. That, that's better than nothing. Sure. Uh, but, you know, it's astonishing because you see how popular marijuana is. And yet, no major party is adopting this on their platform. Isn't that astonishing? Like, zero of the two main parties support legalizing marijuana. The closest that we have is the Democratic Party. Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, supporting decriminalization. Like, 
15 states are now past that. I mean, why does it take so much time for politicians to catch up with where the rest of the country is? It's frustrating. Now, on top of that, Oregon broke new ground. My state, I am just so thrilled with the results. Not only did we vote to legalize medical mushrooms, we overwhelmingly voted to decriminalize all drugs. I repeat, all drugs. And this won by 17.6 points. And as Oregon Live explains, Oregon made history Tuesday night in the movement to reconsider the nation's war on drugs by becoming the first state to decriminalize small amounts of heroin and other street drugs. Voters overwhelmingly supported Measure 110, a coup for the New York-based Drug Policy Alliance, the same criminal justice reform group that backed Oregon's successful marijuana legalization effort in 2014. Peter Zuckerman, campaign manager for Measure 110, called the win a big step forward. Today is a huge day of celebration, but the work is not over and we have a lot more work to do to win a better system for everybody, he said. So I'm thrilled with this. And let me tell you that when we voted to legalize recreational marijuana back in 2014, it really took a lot of convincing. People in my own social circles were really hesitant about this. And now that it passed, it is extremely, extremely popular. People who thought they'd never try pot, they did because you could walk into a store and easily buy as much as you want, basically, as much as you need, at least for a while. Um, and so since that was so successful, it didn't take much to convince people. Like, I don't know anyone in my immediate social circles, including people who are conservative, who were against decriminalizing all drugs. And anyone who is a little bit reluctant, all I do is point them to this article from The Guardian, where it talks about how Portugal, when they decriminalized drugs back in 2001, the results that we're seeing now are stunning. They're effective. This is the way to go. So, you know, all it takes is a little bit of progress and the dam will burst open. You know, it leads to more and more good policy. So now that we are decriminalizing drugs in Oregon, once we prove that it's effective, if we can do that, which I think we will, you are going to see more states follow suit. And I'm going to predict Colorado, Washington State, D.C. These are going to be the next ones who are going to um, to go this direction as well. Um, now, let's talk about some other really interesting ballot initiatives. So in Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans narrowly voted to become a U.S. state. Now, this doesn't mean that they have statehood immediately, but what this does mean is that they will now pursue statehood by appointing a seven-member commission and by developing a transition plan in order to become an actual state. Now, if you are a Democrat, this is good news. If you are not a Republican, I should say, anyone who's on the left, socialist, this is good news. Because if they were to become another state, that means we get two more senators. And that's just if we're talking with regard to self-interest. But now people in Puerto Rico, if they actually have a chance to become part of the United States, they would get full citizenship, representation. So I think this is great. But this was always up to them to decide. We don't get to decide for them. It's about self-determination. And it seems as if they want to become a state. I think this is great. Now, additionally, in Nevada, voters approved question six, which requires utilities to acquire 50% of their electricity from renewable resources by 2030. This isn't necessarily revolutionary, but it's a huge step in the right direction. And I really applaud them for this. Also in Florida, they voted to approve a $15 an hour minimum wage, although there's kind of a catch uh, by 2026. So starting in September of 2021, it'll increase to $10. Then in 2022, $11, 2023, $12, so on and so forth until it reaches $15. This is good news. Don't get me wrong, but by the time it's actually $15 an hour, it will need to be $20, $25 an hour, depending on where you are in Florida. So we've been fighting for 15 for so long that now we need to ask for a lot more. But this is this is progress, right? It's incremental progress at this point, but it's progress nonetheless. But it's good. It's a good thing. And what it shows is that when you put progressive issues on the ballot, more often than not, voters are going to opt for the progressive option, but not always. So in the state of Louisiana, they had a vote on whether or not they'd amend their constitution to ban abortion effectively, including that there is no right to abortion in their constitution. Amendment 1 passed. So this means that in the event Roe v. Wade is overturned, the state of Louisiana will automatically and immediately have an abortion ban in effect, since this is now going to be codified in their constitution. This passed. And um, 
that's really disappointing because the people who are voting for this, they think that, oh, well, if we just ban abortion, that's going to stop it. But they don't apply that same logic to guns. They think that liberals want to ban guns. But they say, oh, well, if you if you do that, it's just going to lead to, you know, the black market being emboldened. They don't also apply this to drugs and whatnot. But what is this going to do? This isn't going to stop the number of abortions. This will just increase the number of unsafe, illegal abortions, which means that women are going to be hurt by this if Roe v. Wade does, in fact, get overturned. Now, we don't know, but this is them putting their foot forward saying, we just got to wait for the Supreme Court to do its thing. And abortion is illegal immediately under our state constitution. Very disappointing uh, because this result is, it's barbaric. It's irrational. If you want to stop abortions from happening, there's a very easy way to do that. You fund sex education. You allow people to access contraception. Give it away for free. That's how you stop abortions, not by banning it because you're not banning, you're not stopping abortions by banning them. You're just making them uh, take place under the shadows. Now, there is another referendum that happened in Massachusetts that I was ecstatic about. In Maine, in 2018, they passed ranked choice voting. And I predicted back then that we will now see the domino effect as we did with pot legalization when Washington and Colorado did that. And so Massachusetts had ranked choice voting on the ballot. And for whatever reason, they voted against it. They voted against giving themselves more of a say, more options, without worrying about the spoiler effect. This is astonishing. It doesn't make sense. But anyone who's from Massachusetts, if you voted against this, you don't get to complain about the spoiler effect anymore. You don't get to complain about the two-party duopoly because you just voted to make that a reality. What are you thinking? Now, I don't know what the ad campaign... Uh, both campaigns were like. Maybe there was a lot of propaganda and misinformation. But either way, this is a result that is irrational, to say the least. Embarrassing. I'm sorry, this is embarrassing. If Oregon voted down ranked choice voting, I would be deeply disappointed in my state. But propaganda and misinformation and big money oftentimes leads to a result that doesn't go um, in the reasonable pro-labor way. Because California's Proposition 22 passed, which exempts companies like Uber and Lyft from treating their drivers as employees. So as CNN explains, in a major win for gig economy companies, CNN projects California voters have passed a costly and controversial ballot measure to exempt firms like Uber and Lyft from having to classify their gig workers in the state as employees rather than as independent contractors. Backed by more than $200 million from Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, and Uber-owned Postmates, Proposition 22, or Prop 22, is the costliest ballot measure in California's history, according to Ballotpedia, underscoring how important its passage was to the future of their businesses. Uber and Lyft stocks are both up over 11% on the news. Yeah, so this is anti-worker. These drivers are employees of these companies and people in California, probably because they were duped by lots and lots of misinformation and propaganda, voted against having these companies treat employees as employees preposterous. So I hope that this is either overturned or the legislature in California takes action because this is ridiculous. Now, this um, initiative or this proposition, I should say, uh, I think that the catalyst for this was actually state action from the legislature. So we'll see how this plays out. But the fact that Californian voters fell for this, it's really frustrating. Now, I think that this is a little bit of self-interest because the fear-mongering, at least that I'm familiar with, is that, oh, well, if we do this, if we force Uber and Lyft to treat their drivers as employees, well, then the costs will go up. And for me, I don't want to deal with that. So I'm not an Uber driver. So uh, fuck it. Let's, let's vote in favor of these big companies. It's disappointing. And we see the same type of sentiment, uh, which I think is misguided when it comes to the minimum wage, or at least we did before, where people would say, look, I don't want the minimum wage to increase because that means that there's going to be inflation. When in actuality, the way that the minimum wage has been implemented, the $15 an hour minimum wage in cities across the country, it hasn't led to that. It's had phenomenal results. So, you know, the big money individuals in this race, Uber, Lyft, they were victorious. Now, Prop 17 in California... Uh, they voted to re-enfranchise felons. Excellent news. Excellent news. Um, you can't have a democracy if you do not have um, 
universal suffrage. You, you just can't. It's not a thriving democracy if a large portion of the population can't vote. So the fact that they expanded eligibility and made it so felons can vote, this is a win for democracy. This is, this is great. So overall, we had some really gigantic revolutionary steps forward pass at the state level. But, you know, it's not 100% victories, but overall, I'm really excited. At least when it comes to, you know, uh, recreational marijuana, we are moving forward in this country, regardless if, you know, the national government isn't doing anything. But, you know, you win some, you lose some. Ranked choice voting passed in Maine, didn't pass in Massachusetts. Maybe going forward, we can educate more people about this. Either way, not too bad for ballot initiatives for the left. And it, it proves that, you know, if you are bold and unapologetically progressive, more often than not, you're going to strengthen your position, make it more likely that you win. Because in a state like Florida, where Joe Biden loses, but a $15 an hour minimum wage passes, I mean, even though Joe Biden supports that, he should have been running ads in Florida championing the $15 an hour minimum wage. So I think that, you know, I hope that Democratic Party strategists pull their heads out of their asses and see that these types of ballot initiatives, they're very popular. So if you don't adopt this into your platform, you are hurting yourself. Claire McCaskill is a former United States senator who lost her election in 2018, and almost immediately after she lost her election, she was hired by MSNBC to explain how Democrats can be successful in their elections. Let me repeat that. Someone who lost their election is now giving advice to Democrats on how to win elections. Doesn't make a lot of sense. But regardless... She is an analyst for MSNBC, and she's going to explain to us why she believes Joe Biden didn't perform as well in key swing states as he was expected to. Take a look. It's hard to pinpoint. I think it began uh, around cultural issues. The Republican Party, I think, very uh, adroitly adopted cultural issues as part of their main theme, whether you're talking guns or issues surrounding the right to abortion in this country, or things like gay marriage and the right for transsexuals and, and other people who we as a party have tried to, quote unquote, look after and make sure that they're treated fairly. As we, you know, circled those issues, we left some voters behind and Republicans dove in with a vengeance and grabbed those voters. And you've seen this shift. You saw it in the South. I've seen it in the rural areas of my state. Uh, so we've got to get back to the meat and potatoes issues. We've got to get back to the issues where we are taking care of their families. And we also need to quit acting like we're smarter than everybody else because we're not. So first of all, big yikes on her referring to trans people as transsexuals. Um, second of all, if she were saying, look, Democrats can't just remain hyper focused on cultural issues and exclusively focused on identity politics, and they should also broaden their economic message, I would say... Sure, I agree with that, right? Of course, you need to have good social policy, but also sound economic policy that will materially materially improve people's lives. No disagreement if that were the case. But that's not necessarily what she's saying. Basically, what she's saying is Democrats need to be more racist. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Mike, come on, you are being way, way too cynical here. You should interpret what she's saying more charitably. But, um... No, <laughs> because we've seen what she thinks is a winning strategy back in 2018. When she was up in a tough re-election race against Josh Hawley, at the last minute, we know exactly what her strategy was. It wasn't to offer people sound economic policy, material benefits. She got more racist. I voted for over 70% of President Trump's judicial nominees. 70%. I voted for more than half of his cabinet members. I vote with him half the time. He signed 38 of my bills into law. That doesn't sound like, to me, somebody who is knee-jerk. Some of my colleagues are knee-jerk against the president. I don't get up every day figuring out how to fight the president. I get up every day trying to figure out how I can fight for Missourians. To that point, you have this radio ad out now that says, at one point in an exchange, she's not one of these crazy Democrats. Claire's not afraid to stand up against her own party. Yep, and Claire's not one of those crazy Democrats. Who's the crazy Democrat? The crazy Democrats are people who walk in restaurants 
and scream in elected officials' faces. The crazy Democrats are, we have a state senator here in Missouri that actually advocated for the assassination of President Trump. That's a crazy Democrat. Um, I don't do those things. I am not somebody who thinks that we should ever be uncivil. I think what most Missourians want is for us to listen to each other, figure out where we can compromise, not scream in each other's faces, not call each other names. So I'm really talking about um, civility here. I'm talking about being polite, having good manners. Well, just to be clear, there's not another crazy Democrat in the Senate. Well, I would say this. I would not call my colleagues crazy, but Elizabeth Warren sure went after me when I advocated tooling back some of the regulations for small banks and, and credit unions. Um, I certainly disagree with Bernie Sanders on a bunch of stuff. Um, so this caravan is getting a lot of attention. It's stop coming. them at the border. And what do you do? When they get to the border, what do you do? The, I think the president has to use every tool he has at his disposal, and I'm 100% back him up on that. Big yikes. Now, she's not talking about broadening their economic message. She's talking about embracing identity politics, albeit the white identity politics that we see championed relentlessly by the Republican Party. So when she talks now about how Democrats can't just be hyper-focused on identity politics and cultural issues, they need, you know, to appeal to people, let them know how to put food on the table. Right, but you didn't do that. So of course, when she says this, we have no choice. We have to interpret this as her saying, Democrats should probably be a little bit more racist. Because that's what she did, and guess what? That was a losing strategy. Now, maybe I am being a little bit too cynical, too unfair to her, and maybe she realizes that her 2018 strategy was a failure and that you really do need to be more progressive. Let people know that you're going to help them put food on the table, strengthen our social safety net, offer people Medicare for all, a $15 an hour minimum wage. But that's not the case because she has been unequivocally against leftist policy ideas that are very popular, even in places like the Rust Belt. I mean, Joe Biden... He lost the Sun Belt. He lost Florida, but yet a $15 an hour minimum wage was approved via ballot initiative. You have to put two and two together. It's not that difficult, folks. It's, it's common sense, but yet they don't get it and they don't want to be more leftist. It's easier for Democrats to move to the right because that won't offend their corporate donors. So that's what she did. So her advice to Democrats uh, after she lost by trying this is uh, be more racist. <laughs> I mean, look, you can say I'm being too unfair. That's fine. But uh, again, I think that her actions speak louder than her words. Now, I love this because AOC took to Twitter to call her out for this saying, why do we listen to people who lost elections as if they are experts in winning elections? McCaskill tried her approach. She ran as a caravan hysteria Democrat and lost while grassroots organizers won progressive measures in Missouri. Her language here shows how she took her base for granted. And that is exactly it. Why are Democrats listening to people who lost? How often have we seen James Carville on MSNBC after this imbecile wrote a book titled something to the effect of why Democrats are going to rule the nation for the next 40 years? These people had their heads so far up their own asses they can't see the light of day. So why are we listening to them? Why are we taking electoral advice from Claire McCaskill, a loser? It's just, it's so infuriating. Now, Claire McCaskill actually issued an apology for what she said, um, but not for everything. She tweeted out, I'm so sorry I used hurtful term last night. I was tired, but never a good excuse. People have misinterpreted what I was trying to say. Our party should never leave behind our fight for equality for trans people or anyone else who has been marginalized by hate. My record reflects that. Okay, so you can say, Mike, that's proof right there that you were being a little bit too unfair to her. Okay, fine. She's saying now, I, uh, I believe in the fight for equality. But then she says, my record reflects that. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't at all. No, you're wrong about that. Quote, stop them at the border. Stop them at the border. That's what you said in response to a Fox News host asking you where you stand on this migrant caravan coming here, seeking asylum because our government's policies destroyed Latin America. Stop them at the border.
So no, your record does not reflect that. If anything, your record shows the opposite of that. So I mean, after you lose your election in a humiliating way after she did when she shifted to the far right, literally, you should be permanently discredited. Nobody should want to bring you on to hear from you ever again about politics and especially how to win an election. But here we are where she is hired as a political analyst for MSNBC to give Democrats bad advice after she lost. I mean, I shouldn't have to say this, but this is a pretty bad idea. Whether or not Democrats are able to take back the Senate is probably going to come down to some really close runoff races in Georgia. However, they will retain control of the House, but unfortunately, they did lose some ground. They lost a couple of seats. Now, even though Joe Biden was at the top of the Democratic Party's ticket, centrists are still blaming the left. Blaming the left, suggesting that it's them, their progressivism, their bold message. That's why we lost some ground in the House, why it's so difficult for us to take back the Senate. It's like this is a parody, but no, this is actually something that Democrats like Abigail Spanberger have been arguing, lambasting the left for making them lose. So as Scott Wong and Mike Lillis of The Hill reports, moderate House Democrats lashed out at their liberal colleagues Thursday using a marathon caucus-wide conference call to bash progressives for advancing an agenda that centrist said cost the party a number of seats in Tuesday's elections. An impassioned Representative Abigail Spanberger, who squeaked to victory in central Virginia, took liberals to task for promoting the policy of redirecting funds away from police departments, an idea that took off following following the death of George Floyd in May, and that Republicans used that on the campaign trail to hammer Democrats with charges of nurturing crime. Spanberger called the Democrats' campaign strategy a failure. Quote, I do disagree, Abigail, that it was a failure, Speaker Nancy Pelosi interjected. We won the House. Representative Mark Vesey delivered a similar condemnation, lamenting that the far left's approach to several issues, including moving funds away from the police and banning fracking, had given ammunition to GOP attack ads. VC said he had watched GOP commercial after commercial using video footage of Democrats uttering the words defund the police to great effect. Liberals immediately pushed back on the moderates' narrative. Progressive caucus co-chair Pramila Jayapal jumped into the fray and argued that Democrats would not be on the cusp of ousting President Donald Trump from the White House without tremendous energy from the far left. At one point on the call, Representative Debbie McCarcel Powell, McCarcel Powell, who lost re-election, cried and lamented that no one could pronounce <laughs> no one could pro <laughs> no one could pronounce her name according to a Washington Post reporter i totally just butchered her name house democratic leaders rocked by the results said on thursday's call that they want a post-mortem review of the election strategy that led them astray representative sherry bustos head of the party's campaign arm who narrowly who narrowly won re-election said she was frustrated by bad polling and the loss of good members but she defended the democrats message and tactics noting that the house remains securely in the party's hands heading into the next congress so i just have to pause for a moment and get back to representative debbie Mukar Sol Powell. As everyone is like arguing back and forth, screaming about, no, this is your fault, and no, this is your fault, no, we should have done this, we should have done that. She just interjects, crying about how nobody can say my name. Yeah. <laughs> the thought of her interjecting and like, if I can imagine the looks on their faces, like, are you fucking serious? This is what you're crying about? Like, we're having a conversation here about strategy and you're crying that nobody can pronounce your name. <sighs> Democrats are a mess. Listen, as someone whose last name is Figueredo, deal with it. Are you not used to it by now? I'm assuming that she's older than me. Get used to it. She lost. Maybe that's why she's crying. I don't know. Um, but look, getting to the substance of this article, individuals like Abigail S Spanberger, are completely wrong. They're idiotic. This is why Democrats lose, what she's saying. Because rather than remaining hyper-focused on every little thing that Dem that Republicans might say in response to your message, why don't you just have a fucking message? Are you really saying that the Democratic Party should go against this mass movement who's calling to defund the police? I mean, they already have to an extent. Joe Biden said, no, I'm not going to defund the police. We're going to actually increase funds to police departments across the country. So you're already kind of doing that. But do you honestly think that if you create a message 
that is, you know, bulletproof. No Republican can, you know, lob an attack against it that is going to stick. Do you honestly think that's going to help you win? Because the only way to actually do that effectively is to just adopt the Republican Party's platform. And I've got news for you. Even if you copied and pasted your platform or their platform to yours, they're still going to attack you. They're still going to call you a socialist because that's what the Republican Party does. So standing for nothing, saying, no, we're not going to defund the police. We don't want to ban fracking just so that way you can escape Republican criticism is stupid because you're never going to escape Republican criticism. They will always attack you and relentlessly so and viciously so, and they're going to lie. They're going to make things up. So all that you can do is get your message out to voters and let them know you are going to fight to improve their lives. This isn't fucking rocket science. Stop crafting your message specifically to appeal to Republicans and to insulate yourself from Republican attacks. Ask yourself, for all of the Republican victories that we saw, how many of them tried to appeal to moderate Democrats? How many of them had these focus group driven talking points that would, you know, help them to insulate themselves from attacks from Democrats? I mean, the Democratic Party, in theory, their policies, as many policies as they actually talk about, they're more popular than the Republican Party's policies. So why aren't Democrats the one making Republicans afraid? Why is it that when you have the high ground when it comes to policy, you're the one who's afraid of what the opposition is going to say? I mean, Republicans have in their platform, we want to repeal Roe v. Wade and marriage equality, Obergfell v. Hodges. We want those overturned. Why aren't you attacking them? Why aren't they afraid of you? What's well, because you suck? Because your strategy is absolute dog shit. That's why. You should thank the left for whatever enthusiasm there was. Had it not been for the grassroots efforts of Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, Joe Biden might not have been victorious in Minnesota, in Michigan. But they don't get that because they listen to highly paid consultants who get paid millions of dollars per year to give them the worst advice imaginable. And she probably, you know, consumes MSNBC and CNN nonstop. That just reinforces all of their bad strategic ideas. This isn't savvy. Saying that, oh, well, you, you have to tweak your message so you won't get attacked by Republicans is fucking idiotic. It is moronic. So you almost lost your election, Abigail, because you don't stand for jack fucking shit. There's a reason why individuals like AOC, Ilhan Omar are popular and they have more name recognition than you. It's because they stand for something. What don't you get? I mean, it is shocking that Republicans, I mean, they can talk about whatever harmful policy. Donald Trump can go on national television and boast about how he extrajudicially murdered a United States citizen. Call protesters in the streets after George Floyd was murdered thugs. And you're worried about their criticism. I mean, a party who is worried about a very unpopular minority party's criticism is just they're not worth a damn. They are dog shit. They are stupid. And I know that I'm throwing in a lot of ad hominems, but they still don't get it. And they're so arrogant. They're so fucking arrogant. You all had neoliberalism at the top of the ticket. You had your centrist. You had Joe Biden running a campaign where he appealed to Republicans. So it's not that the left pushed too far. It's that they didn't push far enough. It's that Joe Biden was resistant to what their input was. So I don't, I don't know what to say. I mean, uh, Democrats are insufferable. They... Are just it's infuriating because it doesn't matter what the outcome of the election is we can have an election where literally centrists lose every single seat and progressives win every single seat and they will still say well this just proves that centrism is the way to go they can get blown out and the conclusion will always be you pushed us too far left centrism is what we need it doesn't matter the narrative is already predetermined it's just more convenient for them to use this narrative to lambast the far left because their corporate donors don't want them to move left. If they embrace Medicare for all, all that money that they take from health insurance companies, that goes bye-bye like that. So of course, they're not going to jeopardize, you know, that money, those campaign contributions. So they pretend as if their strategy is sound and it's really the left who's hurting them when in actuality, it's them, their lack of a policy vision 
that's hurting them, not the left. The left is helping you, so thank them. House Democrats are reportedly arguing about who is at fault for the Democrats' lackluster performance in this election. Centrists are saying it's the left, and the left are not necessarily saying that it's centrists. They're just saying, no, these ideas are popular. But here's what's indisputable. Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, had it not been for their popularity and grassroots fundraising effort, Joe Biden may have not been able to win Michigan and Minnesota. If he won, it's because they dragged him across the finish line, not the other way around. And we have numbers to prove that this is the case. So as Kenny Stansel of Common Dreams reports, Congresswomen Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, members of the progressive squad in the U.S. House who represent districts in the states of Michigan and Minnesota respectively, received applause and praise Thursday for their role in lifting Joe Biden in those two battleground states, pivotal victories that have helped put the former vice president on the verge of ousting President Donald Trump. Among the nation's most progressive legislators, Omar represents Minneapolis and its nearby suburbs, while Tlaib represents portions of Detroit and and some of its suburbs in Wayne County. Both lawmakers campaigned heavily for Biden leading up to this week's election, and observers say Biden's victories in those states may not have been materialized had it not been for that heavy lifting which propelled huge turnout in diverse districts. While the Biden-Harris campaign resisted in-person canvassing, Omar's campaign kept doing it, hiring dozens of people to knock on doors and pull out votes, the Washington Post reported earlier this week. Ken Martin, the chairman of Minnesota's Democratic Farmer Labor Party, told the Post that Omar doesn't need to increase turnout here to win her race. She could take a vacation and she'd get reelected easy. But, Martin added, she recognizes that she has a responsibility to drive up turnout. It's really important for all of our statewide races, especially the presidential race. According to Martin, Omar does really intensive face-to-face -face contacts with a lot of personal relationship building and building long-term power with communities of color, something that a lot of politicians don't do. Tlaib is also no stranger to to organizing in her district. Direct voter contact wins elections, Tlaib tweeted on Wednesday night. Our team knocked doors, called and texted residents, and registered folks who had never voted before. In a late September op-ed in the Post, Omar argued that Democrats ought to focus on engaging non-voters with ambitious egalitarian policies in order to perform better going forward. I have seen the media and even Democrats fall for Trump's argument that Omar's left-wing stances will benefit Republicans, she lamented. We need to win over four former Trump voters, the thinking goes, and we can't do that if we embrace progressive leaders and policies, but while winning swing voters is important, there is a key constituency Democrats need in November that is almost entirely left out of the conversation. Non-voters, she wrote. At an event in North Minneapolis last week, Omar told supporters, it is our votes here that are going to make sure not only do we strongly win this state, but that we don't see Trump's face ever again. So think about this. Ilhan Omar's re-election was... A guarantee basically but she still did grassroots get out the vote efforts in her district to make sure that joe biden would have a better chance at winning the state and do you think that she is going to be thanked for this do you think that her ideas will be taken seriously for this same with talib of course not now contrast what we just heard with Joe Biden and Donald Trump's strategy. So in August, Politico reported Trump's campaign knocks on a million doors a week. Biden's knocks on zero. Now, in October, his campaign decided to change that strategy because it's not a good strategy. And they began knocking on doors after all, just 33 days before the election. So it is indisputable that had Joe Biden done this sooner, he probably would be in better shape. Now, the reasons that they cited for not doing in-person canvassing, I think, were legitimate. You know, it's difficult to campaign during a global pandemic. I get that. However, I've spoken with many grassroots candidates who claimed that they have been able to adopt. You can knock on a door, step back six feet while wearing a mask, and protect your staffers, protect other people. But Joe Biden didn't necessarily see that as a path to victory or didn't see it as necessary but in these crucial battleground states you can't afford to not do that like i get that they tried to make up for it with more digital organizing but you're not going to reach everyone digitally or by the phone you have to do in-person canvassing when it comes to rashida Tlaib, 
This is what she accomplished. More than 500,000 voter contacts. And when it comes to their success rate, they contacted over 200,000 voters. They knocked on 42,650 doors. They made 300,000 plus calls and they sent almost 260,000 text messages. And when it comes to Ilhan Omar, that 88% turnout really is something that is just remarkable with 400,000 ballots cast in her district alone. Let me tell you something, 88% turnout is insane. That tells you that what she specifically is doing in that district is a winning strategy. It's remarkable. She's representing her constituents consistently, producing policies that will help them. Cancellation of student debt, Medicare for all. So for Democrats to not emulate what she's doing, it's a missed opportunity, to say the least. And I think that Jamal Bowman put it best by saying, just so we're clear, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib were major factors in delivering Minnesota and Michigan for Joe Biden. And that's exactly it. They weren't the only factors why Joe Biden won. But had it not been for them, we might have seen another four years of Donald Trump. And that is something that we can't allow the media and centrists to just dismiss because their efforts helped defeat Donald Trump. And they did it not by pretending to be centrists and trying to appeal to Republican voters. They did this by getting out the vote, exciting people, doing in-person, grassroots fundraising, can canvassing, things that you have to do to reach new people. And we saw the efficacy of this strategy play out in real time. So, you know, other centrist Democrats like Abigail Spanberger can try to blame the left for, you know, Democrats not performing as well as everyone had hoped. But had it not been for the left that she blames, it might be worse for everyone. So uh, make sure that we remind centrist Democrats and neoliberals about this fact whenever they try to talk about how, oh, well, it's the far left who pushed Biden so far. It's socialism that hurt you know, uh, Joe Biden, he adopted too many of Bernie's ideas. No, no. It's that he didn't embrace leftist politics and populist politics enough. So I am cognizant of the fact that it's probably a little bit too early to be doing this type of analysis video because we don't necessarily have all of the results in. It's going to take a while for that to be the case. However, I do think it's important that um, we go over some of the largest takeaways. And I think, obviously, Joe Biden should have done better, theoretically. It shouldn't have been this close between him and Donald Trump. Had Democrats been unified on a single policy vision, even if it was just a single policy, I think the election would have turned out a little bit better for Democrats. Um, now, again, this is... Uh, it's difficult to prove, it's speculative, but I think that a lot of people can see that we are in a new political era and Democrats, they just, they don't know how to adapt. They're still running using an old playbook and you've got to throw out that old playbook and you've got to adapt, change with the times and ask yourself this, what does Joe Biden stand for? I mean, we know that he wants to restore civility and, you know, the character of this nation. But what materially was he offering people? Come on, man. Let's look at some exit polls. These were displayed on Fox News live on election night. 72% of Americans favor a government-run health care plan. 71% favor Roe v. Wade. 55% of the country wants more strict gun control. 72% of Americans want a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. 72% of Americans are either somewhat or very concerned about climate change. 70% of Americans want what is functionally a Green New Deal. 79% of Americans favor a mask mandate. 73% of Americans see racism in policing as a somewhat or very serious problem. In other words, most Americans want progressive policies. But we didn't really get that from Joe Biden. Now, the reason why I'm showing you all of these exit polls is, you know, uh, to prove that Democrats have to stop worrying about what Republicans are going to say, because time after time, election after election, we see them craft their message based on what they think the Republican 
criticism is going to be. You can't base your entire identity and policy platform off of how you anticipate Republicans are going to attack you. That's nonsensical. So when it comes to climate change, for example, Joe Biden, he actually did adopt some elements of Bernie Sanders' climate change plan. He spoke with people from the Sunrise Movement. So it still wasn't as good as Bernie Sanders, but it was a measurable improvement compared to what he was running on during the primaries. We didn't ever hear him talk about that. We heard more about how he doesn't want to ban fracking. So Democrats have got to stop trying to play 4D chess because all they are doing in an attempt to appeal to Republicans and brace for whatever, you know, um, attack that Republicans are going to lob against them, they're just hurting themselves and turning off the base. And I want to share a clip from uh, the most recent episode of Bad Faith by Brianna Joy Gray and uh, Virtual Texas. I think that Brianna made some phenomenal points here. I, I participated in the we're going to push him left dialogue because I was trying to extract some leverage at the time when there actually was leverage, if people were willing to withhold their votes for him, now we can all just be really honest about the fact that if the largest protest movement in the history of American history is not going to move Joe Biden an inch on any issue, much less criminal justice, much less any of the issues that are overwhelmingly popular and could have gotten him elected more soundly without this nail biter that we're all enduring right now, then nothing is going to do it. There's like an obvious concerted effort to pretend like this outcome presuming that Joe Biden wins, is a net positive. And to sweep his colossal failures under the rug, to sweep the fact that he's been a toxic influence on down ballot races under the rug, to sweep the fact that, that neoliberalism was on the ballot and it failed horribly under the rug. And I think that the hope that we should have in this moment, what the progressives should be focused on, is to exploit this moment for all of its rhetorical value. If this were Bernie Sanders and Bernie Sanders had caused such a disaster car wreck of a down ballot outcome, Oof. you would never ever hear the end of it. You <laughs> yeah. would never hear the end of it. Oh, God. Joe, this is Joe Biden's monstrosity. And the reason that they're not letting any progressives on TV, the reason why you have this like rotating um, carousel of nincompoops offering their failed prescriptions for what should come next after having absolutely no predictive savvy and what has happened is because they know if they let us on there, we'll speak the truth. And the truth is that this has been an abject failure for neoliberalism and all of the, all of the rhetoric that led up to this, where we weren't supposed to talk about Joe, Joe Biden's real failings or we, we couldn't handicap his campaign, undermine his campaign in any way. Because Trump is worse and Trump is a fascist and Trump's going to get my friends supported. I respected that enough to be running at 25 percent. But now I'm running at 100 percent. If people thought I was going to be annoying before, I promise you I'm about to be so obnoxious. You're going to pray for the days that I was, quote unquote, on the payroll. A lot of the things that she's saying and the things that I'm about to say, they're difficult to quantify. So you can dismiss this as just my biased opinion as a leftist, as a socialist. That's fine. I am, you know, accounting for my bias, but I think that there are some things that are pretty self-evident. Joe Biden did have a toxic impact on down ballot races, not just progressive races, but centrist races as well. Now you can contest that. However, when you see someone who lacks enthusiasm, that's not going to really energize people to vote for other Democrats. You need someone at the top of the ticket who excites everyone. We saw the way that Obama excited Democrats. At least in 2008, he ran on hope and change at a time when we desperately needed hope and change. And Democrats won everywhere. Joe Biden suppressed the vote nationally. This is exactly what they said Bernie Sanders would do. Now, again, this is difficult to prove quantitatively speaking, but qualitatively speaking, I mean, when you have most people, at least anyone I know, uh, who you know, uh, even some polls indicate this, that they're not voting for Joe Biden because they like Joe Biden. They're voting for Joe Biden because he's not Donald Trump. That's a problem. You can't just expect voters to vote for your party and your candidates because they're not as bad as the other team. You have to offer something to them materially. Let them know how you specifically are going to improve their lives. Additionally, um, Brianna Joy Gray said that his record was basically swept under the rug. That's precisely it. 
Joe Biden did not perform very well with Latinos. And if you look at his record, Obama administration's record on deportations, the way that he conducted himself during the primary when an immigration activist confronted him, he said, go vote for Donald Trump. Do you think voters are just going to forget about this because Donald Trump is bad? No, that hurt him. That hurt him. Um, and, you know, not to mention the crime bill at a time when we're seeing a historic moment. People are rising up in cities across the country demanding criminal justice reform, police reform. You have the architect of the 1994 crime bill run. And he may have kind of tepidly apologized for his role in mass incarceration, but he hasn't really did a full about face. He won't even commit to full marijuana legalization, which is a criminal justice issue. I mean, decriminalization is one thing, but you picked the wrong person for this moment. And, you know, we're lucky that he was dragged across the finish line. But it didn't need to be this close. It shouldn't have been this close. Um, and I love the point that Brianna made about how this is an object, abject failure for neoliberalism. But guess what? They're not going to tell you about this in mainstream media. They're already blaming the left. They're already blaming socialism. I mean, on CNN, Don Lemon and Anna Navarro were both blaming socialism for Biden's poor performance with Latinos. When during the primaries, Bernie Sanders excelled with Latinos. So let's just step back for a moment and understand why Joe Biden was here. He became the Democratic Party nominee for two reasons. First of all, is that the media convinced everyone and, you know, Joe Biden and Democrats as well, but they convinced everyone that he was the more electable candidate. Exit polls confirmed that most people support Medicare for all. So what that tells you is that people were so hell bent on getting Donald Trump out of office that they sacrificed what they wanted, their own values to vote for someone like Joe Biden, just to have a better shot, ostensibly so, at beating Donald Trump. Had Joe Biden actually adopted a single progressive policy that's really bold, Medicare for all, full pot legalization, and he ran on that, I think that he could have actually excited more people. And he didn't even have to tweak that much. He supported a $15 an hour minimum wage, and we heard about that at the last debate. But if you don't run ads about this in Florida, whether putting this on the ballot and it's very popular, that's a missed opportunity. And understand why it's a bad idea to run Joe Biden at this point in time. And I know that this seems like I'm crying over spilt milk, but we have to go through these things. I mean, we got Donald Trump because Obama was a failure. George W. Bush was a disaster. So we wanted change. Obama came along and promised change and he did not deliver on change. So another change agent came along. It wasn't good change, but nonetheless, someone who people viewed as a change agent. Why on earth would Democrats push the person who is from the administration that led to Donald Trump? They pushed Joe Biden. And getting back to the second reason why Joe Biden won this primary is because of the Democratic Party establishment, namely Obama, who moved heaven and earth to make sure that Joe Biden was elected. That phone call he made to Pete, Amy, Beto, and probably Kamala, that made all of the difference. It was what the Republican establishment could never do back in 2016 against Donald Trump. So they united against Bernie. And then when push came to shove, Obama didn't really do much. How many campaign rallies did he you know, um, have for Joe Biden, compare his to Bernie's. So they're, they're never going to be introspective and admit their failures. I think that it is important for the left to do a postmortem and try to figure out where we went wrong because we had a lot of victories as well. And even if having an unpopular Democrat who still isn't as unpopular as Hillary Clinton, but nonetheless, people aren't enthused about him, you know, at the top of the ticket, that may hurt us, but still, I think that we have to figure out what we did wrong. The question is, will Democrats be introspective? I mean, think of how poorly Joe Biden's campaign was. He hid from most of this race. And I think that that was probably a good idea because you don't want to trot him out and have him embarrass himself because he is a gaffe machine. But that's not very inspiring for people. Imagine if we had someone else at the top of the ticket who we weren't afraid would tank his polls every time he spoke. I mean, the things that Joe Biden did are baffling to me. He literally touted the endorsement of the former governor of Flint, Michigan, Rick Snyder, who was a Republican, who poisoned more than 100,000 residents in Flint, Michigan. Joe Biden championed Republicans like John Kasich and ended up losing 
states like Ohio, which she thought that John Kasich would help him win in. Joe Biden's team was out canvassed by Donald Trump, whose team knocked on a million doors, and had it not been for the grassroots effort made by Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar in Michigan and Minnesota, he may not have been pushed over the edge in those key swing states. And it wasn't until a month before the election when Joe Biden decided to finally turn it around and start knocking on doors. And guess what? We were told that Bernie couldn't be the nominee because he would be called a socialist and it would be a disaster. And guess what? Predictably so, he was called a socialist. Joe Biden was called a socialist. So no matter who the Democratic Party nominee is, they're going to be called a socialist. But the difference is that you'd have someone being called a socialist like Joe Biden who people aren't very enthused about, namely young people and Latinos and people of color, at least young people of color. And then you have someone like Bernie Sanders, who is also going to be called a socialist, but actually has policies, is offering people something. And look, that's not to say that Trump didn't also run a terrible campaign because his campaign compared to 2016, this time was a disaster. But still, people want change. They want their lives to improve materially. And what I hope that Democrats take away from this, and I doubt they will, is that they have to stop swimming against the tide. Republicans, they go with the flow, right? They see wherever their base is going and they follow that. They don't care how unpopular their policies are. They have repeal Roe v. Wade in their platform when that is deeply unpopular. But yet, they go where their base takes them. Democrats swim against the tide. So if they learn anything, I hope it's that they actually follow the grassroots. Stop swimming against the tide. Embrace their own base. Stop trying to court Republicans. Donald Trump is very popular within the Republican Party. So rather than trying to flip Trump voters and Republican voters, you have to make sure you have your own base on lock and you turn out non-voters who would register to vote if they truly believed, you know, you um, gave them something. Now, even though I'm saying Joe Biden is, is a terrible candidate because he is, he still did enough to, you know, make it across that finish line. So at the end of the day, that's all that matters. And Democrats are going to say, well, look, I guess he is electable. I guess it's the case that, you know, we were right and you were wrong. But you have to understand that they're going to say that no matter what. If Joe Biden lost, what would they say? Well, it was because he was pushed too far left. In fact, that's what centrist Democrats like Abigail Spanberger are saying, literally, that it's because, you know, uh, they were pushed too left because Democrats said defund the police. That's why Democrats lost. And mind you, only a couple of Democrats adopted defund the police. Cori Bush, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And it may not be very popular yet, Compare that to all of the unpopular policies that Donald Trump supports. I mean, you've got to understand, you have to make the case, and it may not be very popular yet, but you have to turn out your base. This is what they want. Follow where the mass movement is taking you. Listen to them. People on the ground are saying, defund the police. So if you don't like that particular slogan, then explain it to people. Win over hearts and minds. That's what Bernie Sanders did when it comes to Medicare for all. It's not like defund the police will forever be an unpopular position. Make it popular. That's what Republicans try to do. They never try to figure out how to tweak their message to appeal to some centrist Democrats who might flip over to their side. It's only Democrats who do this. And it's why, constantly, they're not very good at winning elections. And it's because, you know, um, they have corporate donors that don't want them to be progressive, but also it's because they have Democratic Party strategists who are career-minded, who are constantly feeding them bad advice, and then they have idiots on cable media like James Carville who keep making bad predictions, who claimed in a book that I didn't know was real until this week that Democrats are going to rule the country for 40 years. <laughs> no, times change. You have to be able to adapt. And if Democrats take anything away from this election, it's that they have to be able to adapt, make themselves more malleable, at least embrace one or two major policies that the left is pushing for. You can't just rigidly adhere to the strategy that you've had since the 1990s. It's not the 1990s anymore. The Reagan era, the third way Democrat era is over. It's dead and gone. We are in a populist era in American politics because people are suffering. You can't just cling to a strategy that has been a proven failure. Adapt. 
I mean, this isn't rocket science. I shouldn't have to say this, but I do. <laughs> so, um, you know, regardless, I'm kind of like screaming out into the ether because they're not going to listen to anything that I say, which is why we have to uh, replace the Democrats who are um, doing the worst thing imaginable for the country. And that is continuing to court Republicans and remain conservative and embrace neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is for Republicans. Let them have their neoliberalism. We need an alternative on the left. No more big tent bullshit. Because when you have a big tent party, well, that means you have no ideological coherency. Stand for something, not just platitudes, but actual policies, and you will become popular again. It's not that hard. So before I say anything, it could be the case that you already know the results because I am recording this on Thursday. Uh, but if it is the case that the results hold as they currently are at the time I film this, then Donald Trump will lose. But I want you to know that this doesn't necessarily mean that it will be the end of Trumpism. For now, it may be the end of the Trump era. But since Trump has been so popular within the Republican Party, I think that his style of politics is going to live on. But it might not even be the end of Donald Trump because we are already seeing talks of Donald Trump running in 2024 before the results have been posted and before he's even conceded. Take a look. One other thing I want to note, Jake, and I think this is an indication of where things are heading uh, and, and the mentality that is taking shape inside the Trump campaign. There are some aides and advisors who are starting to talk about the potential, not only that the president is going to lose this election, but that he may mount some sort of resurrection run in 2024. Uh, this possibility has been discussed, I'm told, inside the Trump campaign by some aides and advisors, and that some have even talked about it with the president himself. That obviously is, is something that's way off into the future, but it's an indication that they're starting to feel like perhaps they're running out of time inside the Trump campaign, Jake. So um, that was interesting. I don't necessarily find it surprising, albeit it's still very interesting. Now, this does tell us that Donald Trump, regardless of what he says publicly, is reckoning with the fact that he may lose this election. So he can uh, tout his victories in states that have already been called for Joe Biden. He can claim that fraud was committed, but deep down, he knows he lost because he ran a terrible campaign. He bungled a pandemic, something that comes along once every 100 years, and he didn't even try to put up a facade and act like a grown-up. This was his loss. So he knows that he's losing. It's sad that more of his supporters don't realize that everything he's doing now is all strategic and it's just bluster, but nonetheless, he does know. Um, now, whether or not this is true, it is. Because if people within Trump's inner circle, his advisors, are saying this, then, you know, it's happening. I don't know if they're putting this idea in his head or he's putting this idea in their head, but, you know, they're going to be gung-ho on this because they really want to make sure they have a job lined up for them in a couple of years. So, of course, they're going to be on board. But Donald Trump, do we honestly believe that Donald Trump, being as attention-craved uh, as he is, he would just, like, go away? Of course not. So, I was already thinking, if he loses this, even before this article came out, What's the odds that he runs for re-election? And I put it at like 40%. And now I'm moving that up to 60% because we're already hearing about it before he's conceded. So Donald Trump is uh, not going to go away anytime soon. And, you know, he can run. He's legally, constitutionally within his right to seek out a second term. Now, what will be interesting is that there will be a lot of Republicans who will be very angry about this who are politically ambitious, people like Ted Cruz, Tom Cotton, who want to run again, and they're going to have the inclination to attack Donald Trump for doing this, for wanting to run again after he lost. However, they're going to have to bite their tongue because they know that if Donald Trump uh, decides to run, he's going to be very popular. Very popular because the base loves him. Now, I don't know if that will change between now and 2024. This is, you know, we're talking long, a long ways away, uh, but... <laughs> It will be interesting to see the dynamic in the Republican Party because uh, they will not want this. I don't think the Republican establishment will want this, and I don't think any uh, Republican who wants to run for president is going to want this. But will they publicly attack Donald Trump? 
don't think so, because now they're going to have to pretend to be the next Donald Trump if they want to be electorally successful in the next Republican Party primary. Ted Cruz, you know, he's already trying to position himself as this like uh, off the cuff, edgy outsider who's an agitator who, you know, clowns on liberals on social media. But uh, you can't be the next Trump while you're attacking Donald Trump because there's only one Donald Trump. So if your argument was going to be, I'm going to carry Donald Trump's torch, that's a little bit more complicated. You can't necessarily do that if he's running for president. So look, um, this is a long ways away, but it will be very entertaining at least if Donald Trump is uh, going to seek out a second term in 2024. Well, folks, that's all that I have for you today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far, as usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of the people who make it possible, all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members who help this show not just to survive, but thrive as well. You all are truly incredible. So thank you so much. Now, uh, before we go, uh, I just want to tell you that um, we have some additional platforms that we will be uh, launching on very soon in the coming weeks or months. So definitely look out for that. But it has been a very, very long week. I'm certainly exhausted. And I know that you probably are too. So uh, don't forget to take some time for self care, like to just relax and play a video game, watch a movie. It, you know, when we are living through times like this, where we're, we're waiting on election results, and things change so rapidly, it's really exhausting, mentally, psychologically. So, you know, don't forget to treat yourself to something, anything, even if it's like ice cream or something like just like be kind to yourself because we all need it at this uh, very stressful point in human history. So uh, I'm done blabbing. I'll see you all next week. This has been the Humanist Report. I am Mike Figueredo. Take care, everyone. <laughs>